on behalf of the Norwegian Directorate for Children, Youth and Family Affairs and uh, the expert group Children at Risk within the Baltic Sea Council, I warmly welcome uh, to this conference on sustainable child welfare systems, trust and cooperation in the field of child welfare across uh, the Baltic Sea countries. Today's conference marks the end of the Norwegian presidency of CBSS. It's therefore particularly pleasant um, to gather the uh, entire expert group and the secretariat in Stockholm, here in Oslo, after two years of pandemic. A warm welcome also to all of you that are present here or participate online. My name is uh, Jan Kato Fremsta, uh, and I'm uh, acting director general in the uh, directorate. Under the Norwegian presidency, uh, the expert group under Buffett's leadership has carried out a mapping of the child, child protection systems in seven of the member states within the Baltic Sea Council. The survey has been carried out by Maestral International, an uh, external uh, consulting firm. The purpose of this mapping is to strengthen mutual understanding, trust and cooperation identify good practice in the field of child protection, uh, and to investigate whether the child protection systems are equipped to deal with national and international crises that affect the welfare of vulnerable uh, children and families. Over the past three years, we have experienced how crises challenge our welfare systems, including child protection. Two years of pandemic, and now, almost four months of war in Ukraine, uh, show how critical it is that we have sustainable uh, child protection systems that can adapt quickly, coordinate with uh, other sectors, and develop new uh, services, while safeguarding the fundamental rights of children and families. Therefore, I look uh, forward to the results of this mapping and other interventions that highlight the field of uh, child protection uh, internationally, as well as views and reflections uh, on what promotes trust, cooperation, and mutual understanding. With this, I will give the word to the special advisor in uh, the Department of International Services here in uh, Buftir, Unni Nygård. Thank you very much, uh, Jan Kato. Yes, it's been a strange few years, and some dramatic last months. A period that has also affected the work we do in the expert group on children at risk. For those who are not so familiar with the Council of the Baltic Sea States, and especially children at risk work, I would first like to introduce the group. To start, this year CAR is celebrating 20 years. The first chair was elected in Vilnius, January 20, 2002, and the terms of reference for the group was adopted. There are 10 member states in the Council of the Baltic Sea States. Denmark, Estonia, Finland, Germany, Iceland, Lithuania, Poland, Sweden, and Norway. And Russia is currently suspended. Children at risk are acts as convener, driver, initiator, coordinator and facilitator to stimulate dialogue and exchange on cross-border concerns, to develop and nurture strategic partnerships and to contribute to the development and implementation of tangible projects. The expert group on children at risk enjoys strong global partnerships and acts as an ally, observer and advisor in several regional and international fora, such as the Barents euro arctic Council, Council of Europe, European Commission, Organization for Economic, Co Economic Cooperation and Development and others. The members of the expert group on children at risk meet at least twice a year. The key purpose of the expert group meetings is to facilitate exchange on national and regional child protection concerns and solutions. There are three major areas 
that form the basic forecast strategy and mandate. That is prevention and early intervention, justice and care, safe and non-violent childhoods, and the implementation of the de and development of the Barna House model is a major activity in that regard. During the last presidency under Lithuania and the current under Norway, the expert group has been focusing on the consequences COVID-19 have on vulnerable children and families within the region. The expert group has shared what the member states have learned during the pandemic, including solutions, experiences and knowledge that hopefully will strengthen our child protection and child welfare systems in normal times, as well as in the current situation with war in Europe. Russia was suspended from CBSS almost momentarily at the onset of the war in Ukraine. But it was simultaneously decided that the activities in children at risk should continue without Russia. As we all know, vulnerable, vulnerable children are even more vulnerable during times of crisis. It was crucial that the expert group could continue its cross-border cooperation and exchange, as well as ongoing activities. As Ukraine has observation status in the CBSS, it was appro appropriate and important to invite child welfare authorities in Ukraine to an informal meeting arranged by children at risk. This was a very useful and very moving meeting for shared information and update on the consequences of war on vulnerable children in Ukraine, as well as the current situation for refugees from Ukraine in the member states. And with this introduction, on children at risk and the main objectives of the Norwegian presidency from Jakartu and myself, I have the pleasure to leave the floor to our moderator for today's conference, Mrs. Olivia Lind Haldorsson, head of the Children at Risk Unit, Council of the Baltic Sea Secretariat. Thank you very much, uh, Jan and Uni, for setting the scene and introducing the Children at Risk Expert Group. As uh, Uni said, I am the head of the Children at Risk Unit at the CBSS Secretariat. And together with my team, uh, Shana von Blixen and Anastasia Edvardsson, we have the immense pleasure of supporting the expert group. And uh, since our agenda is very packed here today, uh, I hope that you will see as little as possible of me and more of our speakers. Uh, so I would actually like to hand over immediately uh, to our next speaker, uh, Mr. Kai Finsnes, who is the Deputy Director General in the Department of Child and Welfare at the Norwegian Ministry of Children and Families. The floor is yours. Thank you, <clears throat> distinguished guests, dear colleagues and friends. I'm pleased to be able to address you today and commend you on the important work you do and also congratulate you on the new report on child protection. Seven years have passed since the report Family Support and Alternative Care that gave us an overview on forms of alternative care in the region, including key determinants for quality care, reasons for placements, and statistics. I understand the report you are launching today will give us an update and broaden our perspectives in order to better understand uh, the core elements of inclusive, sustainable, and resilient national child protection systems. The overall mission of the Council of the Baltic Sea States Expert Group on Children at Risk is to contribute towards advancing the identified priorities and support the implementation of the UN Convention on the Right of the Child. The focus of the work is to promote children's rights and regional cooperation of children on children at risk to end abuse, exploitation, trafficking and violence against children. 
As adults, we have an enormous responsibility towards, towards children, not only to our own, but all the children that live in our societies. Good child protection legislation and systems are crucial in order to ensure that children grow up in a healthy and safe environment. The Council of the Baltic Sea States initiatives to promote quality care for children in the region are complementary to the work to, uh, of other European agencies. Mapping of national child protection systems is one example. The Council of Europe initiatives in support of children's rights and integrated services that are friendly to the children and families is another. In this respect, I believe your group is on the right track. The Council of the Baltic Sea States is a strong network of countries in the region for various multilateral activities and co cooperations. To become stronger as a network and as each country individually, we have to work together, learn from each other in order to create the best environment and society for our children and families. Despite of the great efforts of the member states, some families still find themselves in difficulties and therefore are not able to ensure the best care for their children. Thus, the countries need to pay even more attention to providing support to distressed families and prevent child separations from the family. In a situation where the child's separation is inevitable, efforts should be made so that the child can still grow up in the family environment. Evaluating the participatory opportunities for service users within social welfare institutions is a pressing issue. In an interesting article from 2017, researchers explored ethnic minority parents' experiences with child welfare services in Norway. A strong narrative theme was deficiency positioning, how lacking a Norwegian normative set of knowledge and skills challenged the parents' opportunities to participate. Deficiency positioning was perceived, negotiated, and contested in the parents' account. The analysis provides insight into agencies and informants' sense-making process, as well as the diverse resources and strategies that parents draw upon in the encounter. The research gives us important knowledge on how families perceive child welfare services, and it also explains to a certain extent why people in general and immigrants in particular have so little interest in the child welfare service. Trust issues have been raised time and time again, especially in regard to transnational cases that have triggered several demonstrations abroad. Bilateral, regional and international cooperation is key in order to get a better understanding on all the levels. All countries would probably agree on keeping children from harm and that the best interests of the child should always prevail. However, we need to understand that the definition of what is to be understood as the child's best interests vary. In Norway, the child is the center of attention, and if the parents' interests are in conflict with the best interests of the child, considerations and decisions will always be in the child's favor. The member states are operating in diversity of alternative care settings for children. Placements are available in different types of small-scale or larger residential institutions, family-like placements, and family-based care. In all member states, the public and the private sectors are involved in operating residential institutions and providing alternative care services. Emergency placements is available throughout the region for children whom the, so whom the social services remove from the family home due to an acute situation of violence or risk, and where placement within the extended family is not an option. To sum up, the similarities and probably are probably greater than the differences between our countries. I'm looking forward to read your report. I'm sure we have a lot of learning to do, and I wish you a fruitful conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kai. Uh, Norway has shown such excellent leadership uh, during your presidency, and uh, we are very uh, grateful to all of the efforts to adapt to our challenging uh, environment uh, this year, um, but also for raising important points like best interests of the child, which I'm sure that we will come back to throughout the day. 
But without any further ado, I would like to welcome our next uh, speaker, uh, Minister Asmunder Einar Dadason, uh, Minister of Education and Children's Affairs from Iceland. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Olivia. Uh, it's a pleasure and privilege to be invited here uh, to meet you today and discuss highly important uh, and relevant topic. Resilient and inclusive child protection systems building on mutual trust and collaboration. The Baltic, no Baltic Nordic Cooperation promoting children's rights is of a great importance to Iceland. And uh, I must say again that I'm very happy that I could uh, actually change my travel plans so I would fly through Oslo so I'll be able to be here with you the whole morning and listen to the great speakers and be, be part of the dialogue here that is, uh, will be here in the morning. And I must also say that uh, child protection is uh, one of the most important sectors of every government. So the discussion here, uh, held here today is of a big importance. The last couple of years, uh, we have put a strain on some of our, our society's most important systems, including the child protection systems. Even though uh, most, of, most countries introduced special measures to support children during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen in many countries and most countries re increased reports regarding alcohol abuse, domestic violence and child abuse. We are very much aware of the severe consequences of violence against children. All research seems to emphasize the impact of violence against children and how it can lead to acute and serious long-term problems for children's physical health as well as their psychological well-being. It can also create a bad cycle as children that experience violence are much more likely of becoming future victims or acting violently themselves when they get uh, older. And it's very important uh, to act in that case. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we have been doing in uh, Iceland. According to the Ch Icelandic Child Protection Act, the main objective of child protection is to ensure that children are raised in satisfactory conditions. This is to be accomplished by strengthening the nurturing role of the family and applying remedies to protect individual children when appropriate. The guiding principle of all child protection work should be to follow a course of action which can be expected to prove results in the best interest of the child. These are beautiful words. And Iceland is often among the countries considered to be the best places for children to live. However, as many of our neighboring countries in Europe, we have been facing complex challenges in digitalization, mental health of children and young people, as well as early intervention and family support. Many problems with current adults could have been addressed back in their childhood. Should there have been more, more effective early intervention methods uh, than we have had? And this is just it. Knowing the severe consequences that violence and unsatisfactory conditions have for children and with the best interests of the child in mind, it is necessary to ensure early intervention. Because otherwise, the beautiful words that I wrote earlier uh, will not lead to action for these children. We have to prevent those situations from happening at all, if possible. Of course, that is not always possible. This has been close to my heart for most of my adult life, and when I became a minister for social affairs in 2017, I was determined to achieve big structural changes for and with children in this regard. When I took first office, Iceland had never had a special minister for children, but we changed that two years later. And in 2019, I became a minister of social affairs and children. This main emphasis of my work in office has been to further the rights and prosperity of, of all children and catching, and catching problems and co correcting them before they become too big, focusing on taking guidance from the children themselves, because who knows better than anyone else what needs to be done. 
In recent years, an increased effort has been put into breaking barriers within the government offices and between different authorities in order to increase coordination and cooperation when it comes to children's rights and children's services. A central part of this was the establishment of a government steering committee on children's affairs as well as special parliamentary committee. Since 2018, an extensive re revision of laws and social frameworks on matters on, that are concerning children has taken place through wide-ranging consultation and cooperation. And because we are talking here about cross-sector between countries, I think within the countries we need to more cross-sectoral work when it comes to child protection, more sectoral work connection between child protection, social services, educational system, the healthcare system, the justice system, just as well as we need cross-sectoral work between countries. At the beginning of this year, a new comprehensive act on the integration of services in the interest of the children's prosperity entered into force in Iceland. The aim of the legislation is to improve children's prosperity in Iceland by integrating and strengthening services, including by giving service providers the right tools for cooperation with the interest of the child in mind. The Prosperity Act provides a framework for early support with the objective of reducing the need for more severe interventions later. Those changes are the first in our journey to unhindered access to support services for children, especially from vulnerable groups and their caregivers, to prevent as many children as possible from having to experience violence, uh, unsatisfactory factory conditions or other things that affect their safety, quality of life, happiness and future prosperity. And I believe that these changes, the cross-sectoral cross work, the cross-sectoral changes will also be the key of uh, handling crisis, uh, even if it's uh, the pandemic or, or, uh, or the refugee crisis uh, later, later on when we, when we have them implemented. And these chances are uh, built up that they, way that we are putting the child in the heart of the system and all the sectors have to work together in, in the prosperity of the child. In many ways, this new act builds on a similar foundation as Barnahus, where, where sectors work together in the interest of the child. And I must say it, that it has been a real pleasure for the child protection system in Iceland to share our knowledge and experience what we have learned in Barnahus since 1998. We have participated in the Promise project on behalf of the CPSS to share our knowledge of child-friendly justice. Barnahus is a model of multidisciplinary and interagency practice working with and for children and responding to violence against children. While we share our experience, we learn so much more from other countries and by visiting other Barnahus around Europe, we learn from their practice and their new findings. Mapping the, mapping the child protection system in the Baltic Sea states is, an important, is important to improve what is best for our child children, aiming for as good upbringing for children as possible. Sharing information and learning from each other is important not only for our system, it is the most important for all of our children. Icelandic authorities have prior, prioritized fighting violence against children for a long time. But still it remains one of the greatest challenges and we constantly need to take actions. Unfortunately, we cannot prevent all bad things from happening to children. And child protection systems remain one of the most important security net of our society. With that in mind, we have already made amendments to the Child Protection Act and comprehensive revision of the Act is underway and will be introduced later this year. And in November 2021, I then became a Minister of Education and Children. Uh, and in February this year, a new Ministry of Education and Children was formally established. With these structural changes, we are bringing together different policy areas that impact child's life, including the educational system, the youth and sports sector, as well as the child protection system and the social services for children. And there be increasing cooperation and coordination between these sectors and giving them more weight. These changes reflect the government's priority to further the rights and well-being of children in Iceland. 
Focusing on tearing down silos and walls when it comes to service and the rights of children wherever we can. In order to take more systematic approach to the implementation of the children's rights policy and action an action plan, Child Friendly Iceland was adopted by the Parliament in June 2021. Special emphasis is placed on children's rights, uh, international cooperation in the policy, and the vision to prioritize the rights of children systematically in international cooperation projects. Furthermore, according to the action plan, the aim is that the Iceland authorities will ratify the Hague Convention on Child Protection by the end of 2023. To help us monitor how those changes are going, we will use a system of monitoring through the National Supervisory Authority and uh, a new Icelandic Child Prosperity Dashboard. We have high hopes that those recent changes will be successful. We also need to listen to the experiences and good example of other countries, learn from mistakes and follow strong leads. Therefore, I'm very excited to see the results of the comprehensive mapping of the national child protection system and promising practices in the Baltic Sea region presented here today. And I would like to thank the Norwegian presidency for this uh, excellent initiative. The results will, without a doubt, prove to be a valuable tool in building back better after the COVID-19 pandemic. I hope that similar to Barnahus, the legislation that I mentioned here earlier and dashboard for the prosperity of children could become another basis for excellent cooperation uh, in this area. I'm committed and excited for our continued collaboration in the area of children at risk in the years to come and expecting fruitful discussion here uh, today. And I'm going to end on saying that I was started on that you're working in the most important sector of uh, all. And the most important thing is not what is being said here today, is what we bring home with us. How we're going to use uh, conferences and meetings like this one to empower ourselves to go home, not only to discuss uh, and talk about what other countries are doing well, but how we can implement it, how we can empower ourselves, empower the political leaders, empower people at ministries, the NGOs to work with us, because that is what it's all about. It is about children and uh, and how we can make the world better for them. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for that inspiring uh, presentation. I'm sure that we will all be set on bringing home the learnings from this conference and really make something uh, constructive of it. Uh, and of course, we can commit to that uh, in the context of the Children at Risk Expert Group, where we will certainly continue the dialogue, the exchange, the practical projects, and, and get to work on what we learn here today and in the study. So, we will now turn to our next speakers, uh, Dr. Jörn Holm Hansen, who is a research professor at the Norwegian Institute for Urban and Regional Research at the Oslo Metropolitan University, and Dr. Asger Falk Eriksson, who is an associate professor and head of the academic unit on globalization and social sustainability at the Department of Social Work, Child Welfare and Social Policy at the Oslo Metropolitan University. The floor is yours. I hope I got it all. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, that's a, actually an internal joke. It takes too long. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, uh, and uh, yes. Uh, I'm going to present uh, the first part here about the project called Consent, Cosmopolitan Turn and Democratic Sentiments. And my esteemed colleague will take you through Romania uh, afterwards. So, uh, first of all, the project. Um, the project is a comparative bilateral uh, uh, one uh, between Norway and Romania. And we answered the call on cosmopolitanism uh, in uh, 2018. And we asked, in, is child protection practices aligned with the Convention on the Rights of the Child? And if not, what then? And the reason we, we or how we bent it is that uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child is a cosmopolitan document and uh, it is also the law of the land uh, or it is uh, the obligation the formal obligation that 
countries in Europe actually have towards children. This means that we have uh, an analytical tool here that we can bend everything across, uh, namely to ask whether or not uh, national legislation has, uh, or, uh, national practices, policy practices, professional practices, have taken this cosmopolitan turn and uh, aligned itself with a normative order that is uh, on a cosmopolitan level and not nationally uh, situated. So uh, this means that we have the, this, this analytical tool means that we can use it as a counterfactual to not to say that people are actually doing this, but we know a little bit about what it means to align policies, align legislation and professional practice along a cosmopolitan turn, and then go ahead and, and analyze countries afterwards. Um, so this means that we have a thin conception of justice that is an normatively biased towards human rights, of course, that, that countries must align with. And what does that mean? So we're talking about the human rights standard. And one of those first things that we uh, need to dwell on is that rights are indivisible. And what do we mean by that? It means that human rights primarily have the same aim. Uh, all the different rights are equal articulations of the same aim, namely to safeguard and protect the dignity of the human person. And so uh, it doesn't make sense to uh, take them apart and say that it's, uh, it, the important one is Article 12 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. That doesn't make sense because it's connected with to understand the entire picture of, of how human rights actually work in practice. Um, it has, when you go back in time, you can uh, reconstruct this normativity, the human rights standard, and uh, link it to the Universal Declaration, Article 1, which states that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and right. And so this is at the core, this is the aim. You have it in, in the Universal Declaration and also in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. You see it in, uh, especially in the, the most important one in my uh, article 3.1, which is the best interest principle. So, furthermore, rights govern through self-rule. And this implies that you have to, in, if you're going to align yourself with this human rights standard, you have to allow rights to govern how, how everything works. Uh, whenever you do not <laughs> align yourself with the human rights standard, you fall uh, under the suspicion of actually working against rights. And, uh, and this kind of speaks to the tricky part because it needs to be pushing the designs of legislation, of policy and professional practices all the time. And it draws its legitimacy primarily from the fact that human rights are very much democratically instituted. They are something we want to uh, enforce. We want them. And so in order for us to actually uh, reach the aim of having the, this human rights standard implemented, we have to always uh, ask whether or not uh, this or that policy practice, this or that professional practice, legislation, whatever, is actually aligned with the human rights standard. Uh, to child protection services. This is actually a very, very important area because rights here are uh, in the walls. They are uh, embedded in everything you do because children are, have these rights irrespective of child protection services. They carry these rights, but child protection services needs to enforce them, needs to respect them. and. If they don't, if they do not, for instance, allow children to participate in, in decisions that affect them, which is uh, speaking to the Article 12.2 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, to speak of one, um, you are not aligned with the Convention on the Rights of the Child in practice. So then that becomes a criticism. Um, and working on this um, uh, using this normative uh, push to design child protection services all the time uh, means that you have to 
understand the rationale behind it. And so, to quote Immanuel Kant, um, who, who speaks of human rights, who speaks of rights, and he says that a, an empirical system um, may furnish the jurist with excellent guidance, but an empirical system that is void of rational principles is like the wooden head in the fable of the Druze. It's fine enough in appearance, but unfortunately it wants brain, and hence the wooden head. But it's, uh, the, the thing is that you need to understand how rights are pushing practices, pushing how you develop legislation, pushing how you develop um, policies. So for instance, just one example, if you have a foster care system that splits siblings apart, how can you do that? if these siblings have a right to family life. You do it for practical purposes, because they are so hard to get foster, care, uh, foster parents to actually take in more than two siblings. That's what research suggests. So there are numerous ways to use this human rights standard to push and understand how to develop practices, professional practices, how to develop policies, how to develop legislation. So, uh, but one of the most important ones is to understand at the core of, of human rights is the freedom from interference and uh, an unlawful dominance. In combination, these two features of human rights are, are kind of the, the hallmarks because you also need to <laughs> equate in the, 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 the parents here. They have a freedom from interference. They have a right to family life. So that is actually what we are working with here. They, you should not enter that life before you have a reason to. And very often that is because of the, the unlawful dominance where the child is, is experiencing uh, uh, a violation of their right to a freedom from violence, which is a formulation of that, uh, in my view, is... Uh, uh, along with the human rights standard and a way to understand what child protection is about. It's to enforce the right to a freedom from violence. And how are Norway and Romania doing when it comes to enforcing these rights? We're not going to go into Norway now because uh, that takes also a lot more time than we have. But we're going to dwell on a little bit about on Romania. Uh, and the project that we have not in to, to, to sideline what I said initially about uh, the indivisibility of human rights, but we do focus on four very important rights, and th that are non-discrimination, everyone has them. If, uh, and that is, in a human rights way, that means everyone has them, irrespective of nationality uh, and whatever. It is the best interest of the child, the respect for family life, and finally, the right to participation. We look at these in combination and uh, because they are central to the human rights discourse, both in Romania and in Norway. And uh, uh, so now we are going to uh, go to Romania with my colleague and ask uh, how they are faring. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I will just uh, turn your attention to, uh, to Romania. And I must say, I'm looking forward to reading the report. Uh, that is the reason we are gathered here today, to see how you structured the, the uh, comparison of the Baltic Sea Council member states' child protection systems. Because uh, probably there is something to learn for us on how to present the Norwegian and the Romanian systems of, uh, of um, child protection. So, first I will uh, say a few words about the legislation in Romania. Romania signed the, uh, in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in uh, 1990 and uh, incorporated it in law the same year. From then on, the country slowly built up uh, its legal framework and administrative framework system from a child protection system almost exclusively based on out-of-home placement of children at risk in huge institutions, not all of them as bad as those some of us might have 
seen on TV uh, in the early 1990s, but still the idea was to, to, to place um, children in those institutions, orphanages. From that, they uh, tried to move towards a system with a variety of community services and a family foster care system. Interestingly, a family a foster parent uh, in Romanian is called assistant maternal, uh, motherly assistant. Uh, despite the uh, incorporation of the International Convention of Children's uh, Rights as law in Romania. It took some years, uh, seven years, until 1999 to uh, pass a new law on child protection. The law they had was uh, from uh, 1970. Uh, and the uh, main aim of this law was to decentralize child protection. So the responsibility for children in need, children at risk, was delegated to the level of regions and also to local authorities. And children in need was defined as children with special needs, those living in poverty, and children who were victims of abuse and neglect. At uh, present, child protection in Romania is regulated in a law from 2004, the law on the protection and promotion of the rights of the child, that has been republished and amended on several occasions later. Uh, and that law, in its first chapter, defines uh, children's rights as framed by the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and it details its basic principles in line with that. So, I see I have seven minutes left. It's very good with this kind of timer that you really are disciplined. Um, I will turn to the organization of the whole thing. Uh, uh, as we know, in Iceland, it has been, uh, child protection has been combined with uh, social protection and education. In Romania, it is under the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection. But the main uh, responsibility to implement uh, the laws and regulations on, on child uh, protection in Romania uh, lies with the, uh, at the, uh, with the regional authorities. They have set up regional directorates for child protection, for social assistance and child protection. And this is important to notice that uh, child protection in Romania is incorporated in the broader, wider uh, social protection system. And as we will see, that might be a good idea in Romania, probably elsewhere as well. So in all, there are 41 of those regional directorates, plus one in each of the six city districts of Bucharest. Uh, both financially and operationally, the regional directorates are responsible both for responding to child abuse and neglect and for the specialized public care facilities in each region. Okay, then I go to the local level. They have uh, something called the uh, Servicium Public de Assistenza Social. See how easy Romanian is? the public service for uh, social assistance that takes care of, uh, of, of, of uh, children's rights at local level. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I will spend time on going in detail on how this is organized, but we could probably could come back to it because I would very much like to present some very preliminary findings. We are in the process of doing this research. We have no, <laughs> no uh, published uh, findings yet, so this is very much in the making and it's very preliminary. And what I'm going to present is based on our in-depth interviews with the Romanian experts of uh, all kinds. Uh, we did similar interviews in Norway and I see at least one uh, interviewee here uh, I will not uh, present those interviews since I'm talking about Romania. We made uh, so far 14 uh, really in-depth interviews on, uh, on, on these issues in Romania. 
And if you turn to the f uh, four rights that we are uh, focusing on in, in the project, we see that when it comes to non-discrimination, uh, interviewees tend to emphasize uh, social cleavages in Romania. A lot of them talk about uh, child rights, not mainly as a psychological problem uh, and so on, but link it directly to, to the huge social cleavages that uh, run through the Romanian uh, society. And uh, of course we know that the children from Rom families uh, might be discriminated and the Rom, uh, Rom people in Romania are overrepresented among those with low incomes and low education, although there are a lot of Rom people in Romania who do not belong to that category, but they are really <coughs> discriminated against. But also other uh, poor uh, children are, are, are discriminated against. As one, uh, one of our interviews uh, said, we have a big problem in Romania with children who have a less fortunate background, children who are either poor or blacker in the face, or God help, children with autism or other such diseases. Uh, and if we turn to the second of these rights we are focusing on, the right to family, surprisingly many of the interviewees talked about the problems children have after divorce of their parents, the right to, to, to family, family life in the sense that uh, they have the right to um, be together with the, the, the parent who has moved out of the home. And uh, some legal provisions have been made to secure those rights, but culture lingers on. And so, some of, that is also another interesting finding in our interviews that a lot of people turn not only to social issues, but also to, to culture or non-culture. We have non-culture, as one of them said. Uh, I hope you enjoy the pictures I've taken in Romania. Uh, uh, and and uh, a third interesting finding is that uh, the interviewees were not very vocal on the issue of the best interest of the child. Actually, they had not much to say about that principle. So this is something we will delve into and investigate further. One uh, representative of the government, party in government said that the rights that Romanian children are missing are so basic that it's a bit sophisticated to talk about the principle, this as a principle. Okay, participation. Uh, people, uh, some of the interviews, uh, a lot of the interviews also here point out social cleavages that among others are manifested in huge differences between schools, more elite-like schools and, and more deprived schools and children in schools that are among those uh, yeah, more elite-styled uh, schools. They learn how to participate, how to tell uh, their opinions and so on, whereas the others are taught to be silent. And this is something several of our interviewees brought to the fourth. So to sum up, uh, from these expert interviews and on this preliminary stage of the analysis, it seems clear that experts, scholars and politicians in Romania link child protection to welfare in a wider sense. They refer to social cleavages and inequality and also to cultural uh, aspects. And uh, as you might know, Romania like, for instance, Russia has gone through a kind of uh, culturally conservative turn over the last few years that directly affects the things we are talking about here. Uh, yes, and uh, but on a positive note, I would say that uh, the fact that uh, the people, experts in this field, link the problem of child, the challenges of child protection to broader, wider welfare issues is, makes a reason to be a bit optimistic. And also the fact that their system, their organizational structure for this 
is so linked to the wider welfare issues in Romania is also something that makes me more optimistic than I would have been otherwise. Although the problems in Romania are not as big as we might expect. It's not that different from Norway, actually. So thank you. Thank you both, uh, first of all, for firmly basing our discussions here today in the rights-based perspective, which is really important. And then also, secondly, sharing some learnings from countries that are outside our region. And indeed, one of the key things that we want to do here today is to learn uh, from each other. And Romania is an observer state to the CBSS, so it's really helpful for us to uh, get that perspective as well. And we will hear from a few other countries in our group that haven't been part of the uh, mapping a bit later. But now it is time to hand over to uh, Atieno, a senior associate at the Maestral and our lead consultant for the child protection mapping. And she will introduce some uh, key findings and uh, lessons learned from our mapping. The floor is yours, Atieno. Thanks, uh, Olivia. I've been told to take off my earrings because they might interfere with the, with the sound. <laughs> Hope you can hear me okay. So, uh, yes, my name is Atieno. Um, I work with Maestral International. Um, we're a consultancy firm. Uh, with consultants a bit all over. I'm based in Nairobi, uh, Kenya, and we focus on strengthening child protection systems as well as uh, strengthening the social service workforce yeah, for child protection and social services. And most of the work uh, we do, uh, actually it's very uh, varied, but we do work a lot in uh, context where uh, social services and child protection systems are very underdeveloped. Um, sometimes hardly existent, uh, and also in, um, in transform uh, trans societies that might be uh, in, in, in transformation, and as well as in humanitarian context. And so it's interesting to also work on, um, on countries where uh, child protection systems are um, relatively uh, mature, um, so, so that has been a, a learning as well, and I'll just highlight some other things, uh, uh, some of the other uh, key findings. Um, okay, I'm the one that comes con So I will uh, just uh, quickly, uh, for the people who might not have been directly involved, some of the objectives and the processes, I will start with some of the promising practices, and then uh, I'll just go for uh, some of the additional um, findings around there. So just to recap, it was to uh, map child protection system in seven of the member uh, states, uh, look at uh, key elements and uh, good practices to well-functioning, accessible and resilient child protection system. And those were the countries that were um, involved. Um, so, yes, the conceptual uh, framework. So you're all mostly familiar with this because uh, this is more or less what your child protection systems are are based on, so the interconnectedness of all those uh, spheres that influence um, the outcomes of child protection for all, for all children, um, known as this, what is this, the socio-ecological uh, model, yeah? Um, but I wanted to just to spend a little bit of time uh, on this and also because I heard the previous um, presenters. So this, this is the, the, the conceptual framework that we use to look at your child protection system. And, uh, and the system, yeah? And it's six main, sometimes seven main key elements that make up a resilient child protection uh, system. This uh, we use because uh, globally, um, there has been some kind of agreement uh, around this. And ma many of your countries have influenced this on the international scene to look at aspects of what makes up a resilient uh, 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 system, yeah? Uh, so we have the policy and the uh, legal framework. 
we have the governance, the coordination, whether it's, you know, sectoral, because of course it's a multi-sectoral um, discipline. We have the roles and responsibilities. And then we have the service delivery uh, models um, or the prevention and response services in place in a country. We look at the resources and specifically then the social service uh, workforce, but also other uh, financial and material resources. And then the accountability system that are in place, as well as the learning and um, data management information systems. And we look at participation and especially around uh, child participation. So that's how we kind of looked at the systems uh, that we were, um, that we were uh, mapping. And again, like I said, your governments have been involved at the international level, because remember we work a lot in development context to influence this uh, so that this can be used as a model uh, for, for countries. Um, so, re when we talk about resilient systems, so it's, uh, I guess, the ability of um, the system to protect and safeguard all children, yeah? And we heard, for example, in the Romania, there are certain children within that that are more uh, vulnerable, and all the countries have those aspects of children that are more uh, vulnerable. And then, um, also to, to um, acknowledge that a change in one component of those six requires the change in the other, or will impact the, uh, the, the other components of the system. And then, um, uh, of course, that it's a multi-sectoral and integrated with the wider child welfare and social services um, system. So that's how we've looked at it. So child protection system is for all children because it's interpreting the rights of children and to prevent and promote those. Um, and it operates within a wider uh, social services uh, system. Um, and then there are obviously issues that affect a resilient uh, system, and we heard some of those being uh, mentioned earlier. Um, but I would say maybe there are around six, uh, six things that, that, that right now are impacting on your child protection system. And then one of, one of those are the fact that uh, for most of your countries, you're moving from what used to be a more homogeneous population to a heterogeneous population with increased and diverse needs. Um, that is one thing that is affecting, I think, the child protection system. The other thing is the aging population and the... Uh, the way uh, services are organized uh, because of resource constraint and um, a different population demographic. And then um, perhaps um, as, a, as a result of that, a lot of the municipal and institutional reforms going, uh, going on. Um, and then it's also this crisis that we have learned uh, from, so of course, uh, COVID uh, crisis, but again, there is opportunities also in, in crisis. So I try to highlight some of, uh, some of those. And also the fact that um, migration, uh, and again, you've learned from 2015, because we can see that in what is happening with the Ukraine uh, um, uh, crisis. Um, and I'll try to highlight some of those uh, later. So I think those are the things that... Um, that uh, impact on, um, on the resilience, on the ability of the system to be uh, re resilient. So just to say that, yes, we see child protection as part of a broader child welfare and social welfare uh, system uh, and as a continuum of uh, services uh, designed to ensure that children are safe and that families have the necessary support to care for their children um, successfully. Um, and then, uh, again, and you're uh, aware of these, but again, we talk about four main child protection orient orientation. There might be um, more. Within our uh, team, um, we uh, actually managed to cover all of these. I worked a very long time ago in direct social welfare service provision uh, in Sweden, Canada, uh, and the UK, and also in um, context such, such as Kenya, so I worked across these four orientation more or less. 
but uh, what we're looking at is number two and, and uh, three, uh, mainly in terms of your um, uh, countries. Um, all right, so just very quickly around the process. Um, we did a desk review, and um, there's quite a lot uh, available from your countries online and a very vibrant academic uh, communities that are interrogating the child protection and social services system. Of course, we looked mostly in English. We had access to some of the Norwegian documents in, Nor in Norwegian as well as uh, Swedish, uh, those, in, those documents in Swedish. Um, but there's a lot that is translated in English, and I'm sure there's even more in, in your own uh, languages as well. Um, we did some semi-structured key informant interviews um, online, and um, um, we had, uh, like I said, we had three members. Uh, one, who, uh, Bill, who is not uh, in the team any longer, was a focal point for Finland and Denmark. Mihai uh, sends his regards. He is um, quite ill and not able to participate, not been able to participate in the last month and a half. Uh, focal point for Estonia, Lithuania, and Iceland, and I was for Germany and um, Norway. Uh, and these were the interviews that were undertaken. So again, it's uh, very descriptive. It's not in depth, uh, you know, for 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 every. Uh, country, but uh, approximately 57 that were um, done across the seven countries, and it varied um, uh, pub mostly in public sector, but also uh, some in the non-public sector and some at this decentralized uh, level as well. Uh, and just to say, very helpful, helpful uh, focal points in linking up with key informants, uh, referring us to information and documents uh, uh, available, uh, and they were very knowledgeable, uh, and also very interested in the process, which is uh, good, because sometimes you work on countries that there is assessment after assessment after assessment, and the social service workforce never see any change, so therefore they're not so happy to participate in... Um, in, uh, in those assessments. And of course, there were uh, challenges. Uh, social workers are multitasking all the, all the time, required to be in multiple places at the same time. Uh, and also, there's a lot of internal processes, ongoing care reform process, and then towards the end of when we're doing the interviews, of course, the anticipated impact of the Ukraine uh, crisis. Um, and uh, also there's a lot of interesting things going on, and again, we're doing a mapping, so we have to uh, kind of... Um, um, it was hard to drill down uh, more in-depth in all those six uh, different elements of the child protection system, as well as some... Um, it was insufficient time to, to do that. And as I said, we did have internal challenges, which, which created bottlenecks that... Uh, in the completion and the revisions of the country uh, reports. Um, so, um, of course, those seven countries is very um, different context. The child population in particular varies uh, in terms of size, the countries. There's geographical, cultural and geopolitical context. Uh, and positioning on child protection that are different, the governance systems, of course, there's a mix of federal, extremely decentralized and, and uh, centralized, as well as a mix of, 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 of both in the, in the countries that, we're, um, that we looked at. Um, all countries have ratified, of course, the CRC. So, again, it's characterized by strong child protection systems, um, with uh, all elements of that system, in all elements, the six elements of the child protection system in place. Um, and uh, also characterized by the fact that child protection uh, system has expanded exponentially in a very short, uh, in a rel relatively short time span, even though you have um, a history of, of, of uh, I mean, long history of child protection system, but in terms of the actual size of it, um, and it offers a wide range of uh, uh, services. Uh, obviously, there is a difference in how um, the CRC is reflected and how it's domesticated international policy and the legislative frameworks, and then that obviously impacts on the design of the child protection uh, uh, system. Um, 
And I guess some of the main challenges in the context of that rapidly expanding child protection system is maintaining the equity in access to quality services across. Um, so um, across the level, administrative level across uh, countries, ensuring um, that there are context contextualized approaches at decentralized uh, level. Uh, and then being able to, the system being able to be agile and responsive enough to uh, adapt to those changing demands, which I mentioned, and the emerging challenges of child protection system. So I'll start with some of the promising uh, practices. And um, under, under the first element, which is, a child, which is the policy and legislative framework, the fact that the countries are continuously interrogating their own system is a good practice, that the care reform is, uh, is happening, yeah? Um, so, uh, so this contributes to the robustness, I guess, of the child protection system, because they are always making efforts to ensure that the interventions are undertaken are done so with the best interest of the child as a central consideration. Um, continuously strengthening the prevention and early intervention um, uh, programs and services and approach. Um, the shifting from institutionalized responses towards uh, family strengthening programs that will decrease the need for institutional care in the long term. Um, and then uh, providing relevant services at decentralized level that ultimately would improve the outcomes and then strengthen the resilience of, uh, of children and their families. And then uh, uh, countries focusing on the, on, on the social service workforce for greater effect, effect, efficiency, effectiveness, as well as quality of, of the service de, uh, delivery. So this is continuously uh, um, ongoing. And again, you change one part of the, L, uh, the system, you need to change the other. So it's, it's a continuous uh, process. But that is, uh, I think, a sign of very healthy uh, uh, systems. Uh, and also the process of doing this child welfare reform. It is attempting to be participatory at all levels, meaning all sectors, all the administrative levels in the country, and also with interest uh, groups to make sure that you capture the, the needs and the demands of, uh, of specific groups in society that might not always be um, heard or be visible in, in data, for example. Um, and just an example in terms of the Children First Agreement, getting the political leadership uh, um, involved before and agreeing on the, the aspects before then going into the changes, and then the ability to communicate those changes, communicate internally to the uh, to the to your workforce in terms of what that means, the changes mean, but also to the public in in, in general. Uh, the second component of the child protection system is, is the coordination and the governance. So there were a lot of interesting um, aspects in terms of how you coordinate within the sector, but also within the sector, across the administrative levels, and intersector, intersectorially as well. So for Lithuania, had inter-institutional coordination, um, so, uh, and, and the, the interesting thing here was that they created, um, they invested in, um, in the setup and the staff to actually do that because we all know that coordination takes time um, as well. If you're going to do it effectively, it takes time. Um, and then we had, um, we looked at the interdisciplinary teams in Iceland. Um, uh, that emerged from a professionalization of the child protection um, committees um, and uh, um, uh, were able to provide tailor-made and multidisciplinary responses to those in needs. Um, and then uh, we looked at now also... Sorry. Um, we looked at um, coordination outside of the public sector as well, and for Germany, um, 
again, a very federal system, so how they can formalize at the regional level cooperation frameworks between different uh, um, sectors in order to uh, agree and cooperate um, intersectorially, as well as the political leadership at the state level on, uh, in this particular uh, around uh, child trafficking, but also wider um, child protection issues. And then the strengthening of the inter-municipal learning and co collaboration in, uh, in Norway, uh, which also then uh, would um, mean the, con um, the sharing of human and technical uh, resources uh, and strengthening collaboration and coordination across municipalities. And then again to uh, uh, Germany, uh, because uh, again, in terms of the scale of um, uh, non-public uh, service providers, the ability to, um, uh, to uh, there's a healthy cooperation with civil society organizations and the multitude of the service providers in the country. Um, and there are uh, many different views on, on, on what, uh, it, what constitutes a good um, child protection system there, but they're able to, there is space for all those uh, innovation and, this, uh, and, and uh, different views on the child protection system in, in Germany. Um, the component uh, three is around the service uh, delivery model uh, and the prevention and early uh, intervention response and response services. So, um, again, and the minister uh, talked about this, but um, Iceland in providing leadership in the development of the Barnahus model, um, but also how it's been able to be adapted and scaled in a number of countries. Um, and also outside of Europe, they're also looking at uh, uh, these ones. I work on countries that are supported by the European Union Spotlight Initiative on, on the prevention of gender-based violence, and I've seen this permeating around in terms of focus in countries, very varied uh, countries around that, uh, originating from Barnaby's model. And then, um, so it's how uh, a very localized response has been able to be adapted and scaled across uh, countries. Um, and then also uh, looking at how it is integrated in the child welfare system or in other uh, um, sectors in the country. So this was, um, looked at as, as a promising uh, practice, and then um, uh, uh, in addition, responding to violence against uh, uh, children in terms of uh, example from uh, Germany on acknowledging the risk uh, of violence against children and how it manifests in different uh, populations. So ensuring children are um, are uh, protected across border through uh, a letter of protection for girls uh, uh, at risk of, of uh, FGM um, as an interesting um, and practical action uh, to prevent uh, this for children in Europe. Um, and then um, we have the European European Court of Human Rights, uh, which Norway, of course, is familiar uh, with. But we looked at, uh, first of all, the learning uh, that's coming out of that and the learning for other countries. And uh, maybe going back to what, uh, when we were talking about the rights of the CRC, but how we balance the, the rights and interests of children and their families with the principles of the best interest of the child, the right to family life, and the right to be free from violence, abuse, and neglect. Um, and with the outcome of the rulings that we need to make sure that there are in-depth and adequate risk assessments uh, for children at risk. Um, of course, then going back to in terms of the social service workforce involved and being able to um, have um, that, that extensive competence and experience in order to do that. Um, uh, yes, so that's what, so, so basically the, the learnings that are coming uh, out of that experience uh, and the fact that the decisions of the, uh, the European Convention on Human Rights are um, then, um, uh, they're decisive in terms of the interpretation, inter 
interpretation of those uh, rulings in other EU member states and those that are um, affiliated with the, uh, with the court. So we tried in every crisis you look for opportunities and, and learning, because we learn more sometimes from what, what may go... Um, we learn more from, from those processes than uh, if everything was a smooth, a smooth ride. Um, so then we looked at the, um, the component four, which is the resources, and um, looking more at the social service uh, workforce, um, that there was an investment in the social service uh, workforce. Uh, in Finland, there is a law in terms of the workload per child, um, but again, in order to improve the situation for the social service workforce, uh, it is uh, hoped that you can also influence that to reduce the workload for uh, social service, um, for social workers. Um, but it, it shows uh, also, the studies show that the municipalities needed to pay attention, yeah, to make sure that they have the appropriate human resource structure. Uh, and the sufficient time allocated per, per client interaction in order to document and do the work uh, well. Um, and then um, uh, Iceland uh, also developed a method to measure the workload in child protection. Um, uh, uh, so it's a measure of trying to support uh, an adequate workload per social uh, worker. Um, in um, at the workplace uh, level, so uh, the investment in this, of course, is important um, in order to ensure that you provide those quality services to vulnerable children and uh, and families. And also looked at the competency strategy for uh, Norway. Um, it identified. Um, Uh, I, I, I put in place a number of support measures in order to ensure that uh, the workforce had the qualifications necessary that had been set uh, for working with in child protection uh, services. Um, and that includes, uh, um, for example, looking at the training across uh, the countries uh, for social workers, which is... Um, pretty uh, diverse, but uh, Germany, for example, have committees working with universities to ensure that there are certain competencies that are part of, um, of the bachelor uh, degree in social work, and that includes child protection issues. Um, then, uh, um, again, uh, also uh, the importance of the social service workforce was also uh, identified uh, in the Denmark Children First uh, Agreement. Uh, and there has been a working group that is led by the Ministry of Education and Research across sectors to look into um, social work um, education and also in-service uh, training for, um, for, uh, for social workers. Uh, then we have the um, accountability, and across all country, uh, countries, again, like I said in the beginning, that there is that evidence-informed approach to policy development. Um, many of the ministries in charge, uh, ministries in charge of uh, child protection are commissioning studies, surveys, mappings, uh, but also the uh, academic uh, community is very um, vibrant in terms of uh, investigating and interrogating the child protection uh, uh, system. Um, and then, uh, again, many of you maybe take for granted the ombuds, the model of the ombudsperson, but this is a key in a, in a resilient and well-functioning child protection system is to have uh, that... Um, institution or mechanism in place, and obviously it looks different in different uh, countries. But uh, again, because we're looking at the system, it's important also that uh, uh, the, um, an ombuds uh, person or model can also provide important um, system strengthening and advice to 
the policymakers to strengthen the child protection system uh, overall. Uh, we looked at data and uh, knowledge uh, management, and from Estonia there was an um, example of the STAR database, uh, which uh, is aimed at supporting the harmoni harmonization um, around social um, or around child protection, the classifications, the terminology across the country, uh, it, uh, and strengthen the work processes, promoting efficient and high quality production of statistics, um, and also strengthening case management uh, uh, systems as well. It's also part of the digital, uh, digitalization as well. And then the other, um, uh, in the last component of the child uh, protection uh, system, identified the, around child participation, is the fact that, uh, uh, of course, child partic participation features in policy and legislation in your countries. Um, and increasingly trying to put that in practice to ensure that all children's voices are heard because there's a diverse child population, um, a diverse child population, and there are many different mechanisms that ex exist at different uh, level levels. Uh, there's, for example, child parliament um, and advisory committees um, to the Chancellor of Justice, for example, in Estonia. Um, and then uh, um, in, um, um, in the Children First Agreement in Denmark, again, trying to uh, uh, lower the age uh, where children have the right to appeal decisions uh, that are made about themselves. Uh, and other countries are looking at developing better methodologies for consulting with much younger um, children. So those are the... Um, promising practices, and then in the time uh, remaining, which is short, I'll just highlight a couple of more findings in those, um, different, in those six different areas. Um, I think we have, um, perhaps maybe I didn't um, talk about that uh, in terms of um, applying a life cycle um, approach where there is a lot of progress in the early childhood and care development uh, around preventative and early intervention programming for all the kids uh, and uh, perhaps more need to strengthen that at, for older children and adolescents. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, there are um, uh, the institutional setup is very different among the countries. You, have, um, you might have a department, you might have a ministry, or you might combine different sectors, uh, uh, you know, like health or across Iceland, education and, and social, uh, and uh, the responsible for children's services. And um, perhaps also the dilemma to ensure that, equi that there's equity and somewhat uniformed and standardized services and approaches across the country, but that are flexible enough to allow for local adaptation and to suit the local needs in either those municipalities or, or states or regions. Um, and then different uh, system, Lithuania more to a, towards a centralized system again to ensure that standardization and quality and better oversight. Um, and then the federal system of, uh, of uh, Germany, of course, and then um, some countries utilizing the regionalization, I think Finland, perhaps Denmark as, as well. Um, and uh, yeah, but mo most uh, system that we looked at, of course, they tend to develop those decentralized child protection systems. Um, with uh, usually clear provisions um, uh, regarding the uh, administrative de decentralization and clear roles and responsibility for local governments. Um, and obviously the main objective uh, would be to bring services closer to the people who need it um, and improve uh, the participation in the planning and the decision making for, uh, for child welfare services. Um, but we also know that uh, local governments can be struggling to finance child protection um, uh, levels because of that uh, reduced maybe uh, revenue base at, uh, at, at, at local level and also sometimes political will to allocate 
uh, adequate funding for um, child welfare services. Um, and then again, um, there are a diverse range of formal and non-formal coordination structures that are interdependent. Departmental, intersectoral, with ac academia, with civil society and non-public service providers. Um, uh, and uh, uh, again, just to stress, requires the investment in coordination functions as well as a continuous review, because sometimes we coordinate uh, so that we don't coordinate for the sake of coordinating, but maintaining the clarity in terms of why we have those coordination mechanisms um, in place. Um, I think I have talked about uh, this, um, the shift, uh, the, the institutionalization and the prevention and response services. Um, maybe just a, a little bit, uh, again, there's a range of social work related degree programs um, and some innovative interdisciplinary uh, programs. Uh, and again, there are mechanisms uh, at local level for uh, interaction with uh, academic, um, uh, um, with universities uh, to improve uh, the training uh, and ensure that, uh, that um, training for social workers are, um, address some of the emerging issues in, uh, in societies. But there's also uh, great variations and sometimes also uh, very, very much autonomy on the part of the uh, universities to decide what goes into that um, curriculum as well. And then most countries have a licensing body, and if not a body, at least a, a licensing process. Um, and then uh, there are active, sometimes more than one, either social work associations and um, or unions that advocate for the interest of members, which is also another important um, and healthy part of a functioning uh, job protection system. Um, there is uh, probably an issue with the adequacy of the supply of qualified social workers, workers and that might be because uh, you know, younger generation, it might not be so attractive to go into um, to uh, social work or child protection services, which can be a highly stressful uh, environment as well. Uh, and um, uh, the perceived perhaps uh, lower status of social uh, work or any other social uh, sector work. Um, and of course, again, a generational gap you might have, uh, again, for remote municipalities, for example, to be able to attract more senior experienced um, social workers. Uh, able to use a professional uh, judgment based on long time experience with a recently graduate, graduated uh, social um, worker. So again, for the workforce, it's also um, it, it, it's also changing in terms of um, uh, in terms of the um, interest availability. Uh, um, well, I, I guess the supply of um, of social workers. Um, we have talked about this in terms of um, ombudsman, perhaps the last one around um, uh, uh, the accreditation, the licensing and accreditation system in place for other service providers outside of, um, of public sector um, service provision. Um, I think the level of dig the digitalization varies, uh, but we did see that with COVID, uh, there was an increased um, um, demand and need for the digitalization, but perhaps the social sector might be lagging behind than other, than other sectors in terms of the digitalization um, and how this can then um, contribute to more effective work processes uh, in country. And then um, child participation, again, various um, mechanisms in place uh, in countries at the various uh, level and the very local level as well, see in, uh, in Iceland, uh, for how uh, child participation is, um, is done in practice. Um, I think, um, yeah. Um, so just very... Uh, uh, quickly, so very diverse, uh, I think maybe I heard some discussion earlier, 
we might also have just for forgotten that uh, COVID, uh, <laughs> COVID exists when I was traveling because I knew that there was no need for vaccination or whatever coming in here, but I realized going back to Kenya, I needed to be fully vaccinated. I had taken my first shot, so I needed to take, I went to take my second one on Monday uh, to make sure that I can go back into the, uh, to, to the country. But uh, yes, uh, but a very diverse response. Uh, we worked on this um, across uh, internationally, and it was very interesting in terms of the response to it. But uh, I think that there was, uh, we have seen that there was an increase in vulnerable children and families, especially because the safety nets that are usually there, especially through education and other services, of course, were not there for the identification and the reporting of, of um, uh, uh, child protection issues. Uh, it highlighted disparities in different uh, communities, again, that can help us improve the system for all vulnerable children. Um, but it also highlighted, and probably that's the opportunity, that social service is an essential um, service uh, and, should be, and social workers should be considered as uh, essential workers, just like health workers were at that, uh, at that time. Um, and then um, uh, I think, again, we came in in the last bit of the Ukraine uh, crisis, but there was considerable political will uh, that system can react swiftly, put measures in place, uh, make the financial resources available at national and municipal uh, levels. We saw um, some uh, uh, examples of this. Um, that there was increased engagement of child welfare and child protection authorities that perhaps before, so away from immigration, but towards child protection services. Um, and then uh, I guess it underlines the importance of the 1996 Hague Convention, but also challenges um, because in this case, Ukraine are not a signatory to this uh, convention. Um, um, but it shows that it's increasingly uh, important because of uh, brought, about by, brought about by the Ukraine uh, crisis. So I think that's uh, what I wanted to say. Uh, Ten seconds left in, <laughs> in the time I had um, available. So thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Atieno. It's a delight to be a moderator when you have such disciplined uh, speakers. Um, I wanted to uh, thank Maestral and all of our members who participated in the study uh, for the excellent work done and the huge task that you have undertaken. And also uh, highlight that this was made possible by the CBSS Project Support Facility. And uh, we will move on to our next speaker, but before that, I just want to reassure everyone uh, that luckily we have a panel discussion this afternoon, uh, so you will be able to hear more from all of these uh, uh, excellent speakers that we have heard so far. But now I would like to hand over to a speaker uh, who joins us from Egypt. Um, uh, Chloé uh, Lelièvre, who is the Head of Unit Justice and Rule of Law, Public Governance Di Director at the OECD. And she will uh, introduce an innovative methodology that they are currently implementing in Latvia in the context of uh, looking at their child protection system. So I hand over to Chloé. Thank you very much, uh, Olivia. Thank you uh, to everyone and apologies again, especially to Atieno for, for testing the presentation. Um, thank you so much. I just wanted to, to highlight that this uh, presentation and this project, of course, as you can see, is, uh, uh, is um, we're working with the Ministry of Welfare. I know Loris is in the room with you. Uh, I just wondered if he wanted, to, if it was possible, or if he wanted to share a few, uh, a few words. Otherwise, I'm happy to, to, uh, to jump in directly to the, um, to, to the presentation. Um, I'm just leaving a 10 second response or five seconds, but if not, then uh, um, I'm happy to start. 
So, um, so uh, as mentioned, I really wanted to thank the Nor Norwegian Directorate for Children, Youth and Family Affairs, and of course, the uh, uh, Olivia and her team at the Children at Risk Unit of the CBSS Secretariat for the invitation. Uh, we are certainly very pleased to support Latvia in its commitment to improve the system of the protection of children's rights through the establishment of the Vana House model. And I want also to finish this introductory remark to congratulate all countries and stakeholders taking part in the conference with, who have the ambitions to establish or operate the Berner House model. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So as you probably know, and I will not uh, 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 go further into the detail, but uh, the OECD act as a project partner alongside the Children's Clinical University Hospital, the State Inspectorate for the Protection of Children's Rights and the Icelandic governmental, Government Agency for Child Protection as part of this project. We are uh, so working together uh, with the Ministry of Welfare to prepare an analytical study that consists of an assessment report of children's legal and justice needs, and as well as justice services delivery for children in the context of the future functioning of the Berner House model in Latvia. Secondly, there is an assessment of the legal and justice needs, justice pathways and experience from the children's perspective. We're using a different uh, uh, methodology or the existing administrative data of a service provider, but also different uh, needs survey and focus groups. Uh, I just wanted to uh, stop here uh, to share our definition of what do we mean as a legal and justice need. Of course, it can, it can sound very... Um, uh, um, you, 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 we, sorry, the OECD developed this, this definition really to ensure that to capture all type of legal problems and all type of socio-economic socio problems that do have a legal dimension. So exam for example, here we are talking about education uh, issues, problems faced by different, faced by the, by the children and they have a legal, they have, that has a legal dimension. A justice need is the mechanism to resolve that kind of problem. Thirdly, and innovatively, uh, we are also running a cost benefit analysis to understand the associated costs and benefits from delivering justice services. So this includes social and economic impact, but as, as well as responsiveness to the user needs. Um, I know you heard all before, but I just wanted to give you a, a progress update that uh, the OECD is currently final, finalizing the draft assessment report and we, that we will be presenting in the, over the summer to our, to our Latvian stakeholder and that will be validated in the, the workshop. The report in itself will be launched in early 2023 uh, and will produce a set of tailored recommendations. So I apologize if I cannot share specific findings as of, na as of now, but uh, we will be in better position by the end of the year. However, uh, let me uh, share a few of uh, um, uh, some very key high level uh, findings and methodological insight. I'd like to have the second slide, please. Thank you very much. So here there's four key assessment methodological frameworks and tools that are being implemented in Latvia in a very innovative way. Uh, first, it's the uh, OECD framework for child-friendly justice that aims to support Latvia and all of a country, interested country to implement and invest in child-friendly policies and initiatives. And in order to focus people-centered approach, reform and initiative on key, key, the key vulnerable group at stake, that is to say the children and young people. So this framework proposed that when dealing with children and young people, the clear purpose of the justice system and its component would be to provide equal access to justice for all children by placing them at the center of relevant part of the justice system, and in particular to identify and meet the legal and justice needs of children as they experience them, and to commit to a culture that seeks to support this child-friendly focus 
with a, within a broader people-centered approach. So here we are very focusing on a child-friendly system, but we need also to look at the system as, as a whole that is to transform into a more people-centered purpose. So as mentioned by, uh, by Atieno in her, in her uh, previous uh, um, presentation, so achieving uh, the achievement of a child-friendly culture uh, requires leadership, from and clear roles and mandate across all level of government, the judiciary, communities, not-for-profit organization, and the private sector. And uh, for this reason, uh, ensuring an effective whole of government and society uh, response entails embedding our reason to coordination and integration into the policy design and implementation processes. Of course, as you all know, despite the commitment of the people in the system leading the reforms, bringing the relevant stakeholder, the machinery together is a challenge in Latvia, like in many other countries, where we found there is a strong need to clarify the justice pathway for children. So to understand from the children's perspective where they could go, there is this uh, lack of understanding on where children could go, what is their pathway along the system for different reasons, whether or not it's because they may be uncoordinated, but also maybe because some of, uh, some of the services are lacking to respond to the specific needs of the children. And uh, uh, at the strategic level, as you can see from the, from the, uh, um, the presentation, from the slide, uh, the framework considers sound mechanism for implementation, oversight, accountability. There is a strong focus on data, on results for decision making, and of course, adequate funding. Um, we um, so the whole of government approach calls indeed for a clear distribution of roles and responsibilities across ministries and agency at the various governance level. This is very much a challenge, as mentioned, uh, and. We, uh, after some uh, consideration under this approach, uh, one ministry or standalone agency could take the responsibility for coordinating the collective response and ensuring overall accountability. Second, uh, uh, um, secondly, if you do, do not mind to uh, share the next slide, please. So, in Latvia, uh, the OECD carried out, carried out fact finding uh, and data collection uh, last year, and we are still finalizing a few interviews this year. So, as um, uh, this month, sorry, as of today, uh, there was 35 multi stockholder and individual interviews uh, that were conducting within 23 institutions. So as you can see, it was a very uh, uh, extensive process uh, that including the Latvia governmental and public official, medical staff, social workers, legal professional, members of civil society organization, and other stakeholders, both at the national and local level. Um, if you could back to, if you can go back to the previous slide. Thank you very much. And uh, um, we also brought together an interdisciplinary team uh, to participate in the exercise to ensure expertise, uh, methodological guidance, high technical skills, economic policy skills, and relevant experience. So here for the project, uh, we had a peer, an expert who was uh, who was a general reporter of the UN Committee on the on the Rights of the Children. We had experience uh, charity managers. Uh, um, focusing on right-based services development and access to children. We also have experienced economists uh, uh, specialized in quantitative analysis. We of course work with, uh, we worked with local consultants to help us navigate the Latvian system and conduct background research. And uh, it was this exercise, and I do hope uh, our Latvia counterpart uh, also see uh, uh, this benefit. It was very beneficial to see the different reaction and answers to the same questions. So it was very valuable to have uh, these different point of view on the same topic in order to assess the strength and the weaknesses of the service. So we saw different, uh, 
or the stakeholder had, had of course, the interest of the child. But we did see some uh, variation in terms of on how to, to, um, to, to get forward, what could be the solution. And this is very much part of this exercise uh, was in very interesting to try to find how to bring a coherent dialogue amongst the different institutions. If you don't mind going two slides, but thank you very much. And the next one, thank you very much. As part of this kind of project, and the pro of course, in the project in Davia, there is a very strong need to invest in data and evidence. Uh, so here we adjusted our methodology uh, of a legal and justice needs survey to improve the understanding of the unique legal needs and accessibility issues of justice from a Latvian child perspective. As uh, we had, we contextualize, of course, uh, uh, the questionnaire in terms of institution and to the level of development of a 12 year old children, child, sorry, and above. Of course, because it is important to uh, use different methodology, uh, different, sorry, different methodology are likely to be required for different age group. Children of different age experience, experience different problems, use different language, and we go through different routes to resolve the problem. And as part of the project, as mentioned, we are uh, looking at the uh, at, um, children. Um, the survey will be applied to uh, children, 12-year-old uh, children and above. So here we are about to launch the survey, so apologies for not sharing uh, what we assume would be very interesting result, uh, since it will be conducting online in June and July, and uh, it will, and just for you, for your information, it will not only cover re the Riga region, but also all regions in the countries. The survey in itself will aim to, uh, to assess what kind of issue and problems children and young people experience in their day-to-day -day lives. This includes issues to do, as mentioned, housing, education, and crime, as well as family issues. How children and young people understand what they can and can do, their rights, for example, concerning these issues. And of course, where people and young people go for help when they need it. Finally, it will also assess how things could be improved so that children and young people can get the support that they need. Uh, for this survey, uh, we have been consulting with world-renowned experts from the University of Cork, who also, who also help us prepare a consultation a session with a group of children that is outside Lat Latvia together their views on the language, the scope and the survey design. Uh, most of the feedback concerned the length, of course it has to be short, and sometimes the complexity of the question as well as the mode of administration, whether it's face-to-face, -face, telephone, online. So this is of course to ensure that they were fit for the audience. Of course, importantly, uh, there was extensive consultation on data protection issue when conducting such survey, but also the focus group to ensure that they necessarily safeguard for this project. Uh, and uh, just to mention that also this uh, legal and justice needs survey uh, seeks, seek to be aligned uh, to the SDG 16 survey, as you probably would know, uh, that supports uh, Latvia, but also all the co country in their reporting mechanism, I'm sorry, in their reporting commitment under the SDG agenda since the OECD as a co is a co-custodian of SDG 16.3 related to civil access to justice. Sorry, access to civil justice. Would you mind going to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, the third, so the third uh, uh, piece of work uh, as part of the project is uh, the cost benefit, uh, uh, is, uh, is the cost benefit analysis. So here, the aim of the, uh, of the study is to estimate the direct and indirect social economic costs and benefits of current social programs in Latvia that support child victims of, or witnesses of violence and abuse. 
For the purpose of the project in Latvia, we are carrying out a cost-benefit analysis of the Banner House model, outline, outlining its cost and tangible or intangible benefits over a 20-year period, starting from 2022, 2020, sorry, one to 2040. And we are here using different assumption. So we have a first scenario uh, that where the Banner House operate for a 20-month period between 2022 and 2024. We also have uh, a, a second scenario uh, that where the Banner House model operates over a 20-year period and 40 children are received receive services, services annually. And we uh, and the final final scenario uh, relates to uh, operation over a 20 year period, but with 80 children receiving service annually. So when we are doing when we are when we are developing the assumption, of course, the cost and benefits uh, are to be identified and to be compared to what we call a counterfactual or business as usual scenario. So assuming that children who are witnesses or victims of violence and abuse would go through the traditional pathways and services. That includes interviews at the police station, examination of the, uh, at the hospital and treatment provided by social care. So we are focusing here on, in this project on cost uh, that relates to the Banner House setup and operation, including project management uh, related costs that comprise the salary of all team who assist with coordinating and managing the Banner House model in Latvia, the training of per personnel in the new model, the awareness raising campaign, um, as mentioned by Atiano, uh, we have to also train the, the, within, the, within the, the sector, but also the public as a whole. Uh, we're also looking at cost on upgrading premises uh, to provide services in a self uh, child friendly accessible environment, including um, the use of special equipment and specially adapted places. And also the um, cost related to the multidisciplinary interagency services that also include uh, cost to related to the development of the national legislative and regulatory frameworks, since this is an area where also Latvia will be uh, will need to invest in order to ensure that uh, the uh, regulation also uh, will allow the Banner House model to operate. So benefits uh, uh, covers, for instance, uh, the different costs uh, that are avoided from accelerating the process. Uh, that is to say, having on only one interview uh, um, and having all the services under one roof, but also the social economic benefits accruing to children and society overall. Um, before get, giving you some trend, trends, I think it's very important uh, that uh, we commend our Latvian counterpart uh, at the Ministry of Welfare, but uh, who supported the data collection for this exercise, which is the first of its kind in Latvia. It is an understatement to say that it was an extensive uh, uh, um, the exercise called for an extensive sorry coordination. And uh, since data requests were sent to different institutions and aimed to collect uh, different type of information to calculate the current cost related to forensic, medical, justice processes, processes, sorry, and um, and uh, and to treatment. For example, uh, when we're talking about forensic cost, it was the investi uh, investigation cost per average investi uh, uh, investigation interview cost, the number of interviews done by police staff. Uh, when talking about medical exam costs, we uh, uh, requested that data on the number of people receiving the medical exam, the medical professional's time, and etc. Of course, uh, 
uh, some of the data is not available, is not being collected. So we uh, made efforts uh, uh, together with, with, with Latvia and the, economy, and the economies in charge of the CBA to use proxy data to ensure that we have a robust analysis. Uh, one of course of the of the challenges and the current challenges of the situation is the uh, increased uh, cost and uh, because of ge geopolitical factors for, um, uh, and more, more specifically the impact of the war in Ukraine. And um, so and finally, so I'm happy to uh, we are still going through uh, preliminary calculation and findings uh, to help uh, inform the decision on the sustainability of the banner house model. Uh, but we can already share with you that um, some trends under the three uh, scenario. So as uh, to, um, uh, to recall you that under the scenario one, we assume that Banner House will operate for 20 months month, for 20 months and will provide services to 66 children. Uh, since uh, uh, we estimate that uh, the model will serve uh, um, roughly 40 children per year. We know that the negative net present value, means that the investment cost in the in the banner house model is higher than its benefit over a 20 month period the value of the renovated premises start mater materializing sorry as soon as the, re the the renovation is completed and for 10 years in total that is between the year 2023 and 2032 uh, 33 the cumul cumulative uh, reduced cost of uh, adverse outcome for children who receive services under uh, the new model start materializing as soon as children are treated under the Banner House uh, model and remain stable over the 20 year period we are examining. Under the scenario number two, we estimated the costs and benefits, assuming that the Banner House model would continue operating after 2024, providing service to 40 children every year. Costs related to project management, training of staffs and salaries of Banner House personnel are spread relatively smoothly over the 20 year period. The efficiency gain due to the reduced number of interviews and the faster forensic medical judicial and treatment process start materializing as soon as the interviews start taking place in 2022. And we have also, we found a similar cumulative uh, reduced cost of adverse outcome uh, on children who receive the services. Finally, under uh, the scenario three, we assume that the Banner House model continues operating after 2024, but it provides services to 80 children annually. The main difference between with scenario two is that the benefits are of course higher than in scenario uh, than in the previous scenario due, due to the higher efficiency gain gener generated by interviewing and providing children to 80 children annually and the higher cumulative reduced cost of adverse outcome for the children treated under Banner House. So this I'll share with you some trends, uh, but of course we are computing numbers and we are we are generating specific numbers and uh, in euros uh, that we are still going through and that will be discussed before the end of the year with um, with uh, um, the Ministry of Welfare and and different counterparts. So final slide, thank you. So thank you very much. I do hope the presentation sparked your interest in reading the whole report, which will be available early 2023, sorry. Of course, uh, uh, the OECD stands ready to support Latvia and any other country uh, in the efforts of making people-centered and child-friendly justice a reality. Uh, and we, have, of course, would be pleased to continue our conversation, develop new partnerships and collaboration. A final uh, message uh, also to stress that we do, we have annual table, round tables on access to justice. So this is a forum for mutual exchange of good practices and lesson learned. 
that allows um, policymakers to share experience, in, experience on improving access to justice for all, including from the perspective of people and vulnerable and all specific groups. So this is the upcoming roundtable will be hosted by, by Latvia in September. We penciled, uh, penciled in the week of, this, of, uh, of September the 19th. And, we'll, and I'm sharing this with you because it would feature a discussion on child-centered justice, uh, including the implementation of the Banner House model. And we hope to see many of you there. Should you like any, should you like any of information, you can contact me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Chloe, for uh, connecting with us from Egypt and sharing that interesting methodology. And indeed, we very much look forward to the report and to continuing to explore the outcomes and uh, both from our mapping, but also from, from your findings in Latvia. And um, the cost-benefit analysis is certainly of, of great interest uh, to us as we continue to promote the Barnahus model. So thank you very much. I would now like to invite uh, Andrea Horma-Basal, who is the coordinator for Child and Youth at the National Board of Health and Welfare in Sweden. The floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, I'm a, I, I do scouting, so I think it's good for us to stand up a few minutes, otherwise you will fall asleep, I think. And I lost my voice last week, uh, for 10, years, uh, 10 days ago. So it, I'm not sick, but I lost my voice, so you know why my voice sounds like I'm a singer. And let me start to, uh, to thank you, all of you. I think the presentation uh, are really important for us to, to hear about, and I think the challenges that we have heard are similar but also the best practice. Um, I'm really uh, yeah, happy to see that we have a good practice around the regions and countries. <coughs> Coffee as well. Well, I start now, and uh, my presentation uh, deal today with ongoing uh, governmental uh, investigations um, that I think uh, have a big uh, and important impact on the support uh, and protection of children. Uh, but I will also have uh, uh, mentioned quite briefly uh, the Swedish National Action Plan for Child Guarantee. And I will also uh, talk a little bit about my authority, the National Board of Health and uh, Welfare, uh, our ongoing assignments. But before that, I will start uh, with a voice uh, from a child, a girl, 17 years old. Uh, I met her for, I think, two weeks ago in a school in Hudinge, outside Stockholm. And I was supposed to talk to the two of the children there for one hour, but I was ending f uh, talking to the whole class for three hours about everything, everything that we are talking about today. And she said, uh, your job is to listen, to take responsibility, and most of all, to take action. And I promise her that I will take those words with me in everything I do because I think it's really important for us to go from knowing, from knowing to doing. Um, and here you have Sweden. I think uh, uh, the Minister of Iceland said uh, the, dif the difficult of uh, collaboration. I can totally agree with that. You see Sweden, uh, we have three different levels. And uh, of course, the national level of the parliament and uh, government and then my authority, and with a lot more authorities. 
And then we have the regional level with 21 regions, uh, and they all provide health and medical care. And then we have 219 local authorities, and they all will provide the same social services, the school, uh, and preschool, housing, financial assistance. So if I live like my parents do in Karlstad, I should have the same social services if I live here or up in the north. And we know that it's not like that. Uh, and even if Sweden has a lot of ongoing assignments, really good and really, really protect children, we see that a lot of children that still is not going to have the social services they need or the support they need. Uh, I took some examples for the situation for children. And in Sweden, uh, there is about 2.4 million children. I put uh, from newborn to 20 years. I think it's different. I, somebody talks about children up to uh, 18. Uh, in Sweden, we all, uh, sometimes say up to 24, but here is to 20 years old. And we see that it's uh, a lot different in child poverty. We have the new um, report from one, uh, one NGO that says that the child poverty in uh, Sweden are increasing. Uh, we also see uh, my husband is a teacher, and we see that a, a difference between uh, children's education. If you are born, if you are born in Sweden, or if you are born outside Europe, there's a lot of uh, difference between the result. You see from 62% to 19, that's the difference if you uh, go to school in Sweden. And we have 25% of children has the background outside Europe. Uh, and we also have the uh, children out, a place outside the home. And uh, we see that they are in uh, more, they need more uh, help from the 24 different regions for health and medical care, but also from the social services. And then we have violence. Um, another authority put out that uh, it costs 45 million, uh, billions per year uh, for violence in close relationships. And then we have all the kind of violence as well. So even the situation for children and youth in Sweden are good, but some children, they are not uh, doing well. And that's what we need to address. Therefore, uh, <coughs> the government uh, have to, uh, last year in April, the government, uh, see the needs to do something else and go from decentralized to centralized an approach for uh, combat and uh, combat violence and prevent violence. So uh, they gave they gave uh, a committee a, a task to uh, to propose a national strategy uh, that has a ten years of perspective. Uh, and will put some long-term goals and also identify shortcomings. We see today, for example, studies that we that were presented today are also Swedish studies, that there are a lot of shortcomings. People in need maybe don't get their uh, the, um, investigation. When you report to, to social society, and to social services, need of uh, help, maybe you don't get it because you don't know if the family will accept the support or if the children will accept the support. So we have uh, to identify shortcomings, gaps, and also development needs. And the best practice sh uh, must be pointed as well. Uh, this, um, Natural strategy uh, was supposed to be present uh, last month, but has been extended until December uh, this year. Uh, and I think also uh, really interesting that the strategy also must uh, 
draw attention to the fact that violence and abuse uh, against children take, pla take place in all arenas, as well as in the internet and social media. And we need also to address the different kind of violence, uh, violence between children and also violence towards children. And uh, to even the, that the strategy should have uh, a general approach, it's important to pay, uh, to pay attention to groups that have increased risk of being exposed to violence. And then you mentioned the uh, socioeconomically vulnerable areas and also racism and uh, other kind of vulnerable groups. So in December, we have the new national strategy. And from, that, from the national strategy, then you have to implement the national strategy in all the 219 authorities, local authorities. So it will be really interesting to see how concrete the strategy will be. Uh, another group, uh, another governmental um, investigation is uh, an investigation uh, to address the need of the children placed uh, in out-of-home care. As I said before, about 27,000 children in Sweden are placed out of home. Uh, the majority are um, um, boys and uh, have an age of 15 or older. And research shows that children placed out of, uh, out of care uh, have more health problems and greater need for health, medical and dental care than other children. Um, it's also important that the Health and Social Care Inspectorate, EVO, uh, has said in their annual report that they see also shortcomings in the municipalities, uh, in the work uh, in the municipalities. And uh, even, the, even that some, sometimes uh, children are abused and need more support. Um, according to the authority, it is difficult also to offer uh, care um, to target groups for example, when they have several psychiatric problem or never psychiatric problem. So we need to do more, more to the people who work with the children and also to, to intervention that helps. Uh, therefore, uh, this new uh, governmental investigation will be presented in uh, next year. And uh, something really important also is the second point here, that uh, how you can support children when they leave their home, uh, the alternative home. And just today I received a report from an NGO, um, uh, Children Village, that just uh, pointed out that children today get help when they leave uh, their home, the alternative home, but it's not something systematic. It's something if you met somebody that's uh, a good social worker, you get support, but it's not in a systematic uh, model. And uh, then I don't know how many of you, of your countries, has ratified the third um, uh, protocol, uh, additional protocol to the UN Convention. But the third, uh, the, third uh, the third additional protocol is to give the opportunity to children to complain and demand their rights. And now this investigation just started last uh, month, I think, and uh, we'll see if Sweden will ratify the third um, additional protocol. And also to learn how other countries uh, or dealing with, uh, for example, healthcare cases and migration cases, uh, because uh, that should be addressed when you have the, if the right to individual rights to appeal. So I think that will be interesting also to see how it will work and if it Sweden decided to to uh, ratify the uh, protocol. And this is also something new. I think in March this year, 
uh, the government present a new national action plan for child guarantee. I don't know how many of you uh, have heard about that and if your own countries have uh, own action plan. But this is the Swedish one and the aim is to uh, combat poverty and social exclusion uh, of children up to 18 years old and to, to give them the right and support to basic services like school, preschool, school, um, health, housing. And uh, for Sweden, we pointed out different group that are extra vulnerable. And as you see, it's the same groups that you are mentioned and that we mentioned before. And this uh, plan is, has a 10, uh, 10 years perspective uh, and will be reported uh, ex, uh, um, um, not every year, but uh, two years. Uh, they report the progression of the national action plan. And I think it's important because it's really difficult to have a national action plan for the whole children's life. And that's, uh, I think it's a quite good plan because they point out everything from newborn until the child turned 18. And then we have our authority, LMI authority and the National Board of Health and, and uh, Social uh, Health and Welfare. And we have a strategic direction for until 25, and then we focus on children and youth. And I think it's important to focus on children and youth uh, because we see the segregation are increasing, and we see that some uh, children are not doing well. So therefore, we are going to focus on that and also to see the impact we have the, uh, through our as assignments that they give results for the children's uh, welfare. And uh, I think when I started my work at, at the authority, everybody talked about how much we do, and I didn't know how many assignments we had, what we do, and uh, I did a matrix, and you can see that we have 80 ongoing assignments at, at our authority. And they have, uh, for example, uh, addresses uh, early support or addresses uh, children in uh, place outside their home. And I think that's really good work we do, but still, that's 290 municipalities they are going to have the result of our assignments and to implement and to give the right services to each children. And how can we be sure they are, that they can handle everything that we deliver? Like you said before, the social workers' situation is quite uh, impressive what they do. And how can we guarantee that they are, have time to do more? And so we are now going to analyze all our assignments and try to see what kind of prevention level uh, they are in, uh, what ages, uh, if it's uh, addressed to the regions that deliver, uh, that provide healthcare or to the social services. Uh, do we see any gaps? Uh, and do the, uh, and the gaps we see or may see or they address by another authority. And, uh, uh, and the most important, I think, also is to see if we see any results of what we do. Because it's, uh, I think all of you said before me that it's really important to see that we are doing something that has an impact on the children here and now. And I think we do, but I think we should do more and also collaborate with other authorities and civil society and with regions and municipalities so we can do the work together with them and we can address the question at the same time but see what comes first and not do everything at the same time because otherwise I think it will be really difficult to implement our results. 
Uh, for example, I, I, th I think something really important is happening in Sweden. The, one of our assignments is the national board uh, uh, is the, uh, to have a um, uh, national healthcare program for children. We have one now until the child turns five years. This national uh, health care program would be from the newborn until 20 to give uh, some uh, health care, but also promotion, interventions, and, uh, and to see the whole family and not the children, to follow the family and then to follow the child. And this will be uh, presented this year. Uh, and also, uh, like everybody else said, the early and coordinated efforts for children. Uh, we can't do everything by ourselves. We have to coordinate it uh, for the sake of the children. And that's it's really important to do that, but it's really difficult. It takes time, time, and it also takes an effort from everybody who works around the child. So from us is that we do a lot, but let us do more with more result and coordinated and with the participation with the child. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, you will also return to the panel uh, after our break, so uh, we will have an opportunity to further explore some of those things. Um, we now have a break, and I think one thing that we can take with us from all the presentations this morning as we go for more coffee uh, is um, collaboration. Uh, collaboration between sectors in national systems, uh, with children, caregivers, uh, but also between countries. Uh, so let's that have that as a topic for discussion during our coffee break, and then we will come back in 15 minutes. Thank you. So I hope you all had a good but brief uh, break. Uh, we will now to, uh, turn to a topic that has been central throughout the conference and that we also uh, talked about before the break, building trust across borders. And with us, we have Dr. Marta Bivand Edal, who is a human geographer and research professor at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo. Marta, please welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation to be here, and thanks for a really interesting morning. I've already learned a lot from being here with you this morning. So my name is Marta, and I've been invited here also by one of the organizers of the meeting today, Unni, because we were together participating in a project that I was leading, which was simply called Building Trust Across Borders. And so what I've been invited to do today is to come and share some of the experiences from this Polish-Norwegian experience uh, with you. So what I thought I would do is to first say a little bit about what this, what this experience was, uh, and then I'll basically take you a little bit through what we did and some selected lessons learned from there. And of course, I'll share with you information about a report and a policy brief where you can find more information later if, if you like. So to start, I think this really tallies well with how we ended before the break in terms of how do we cooperate both uh, within governments in countries, but then also if you add the complexity of collaborating across borders with this cross-government approach in all of these countries at the same time. Uh, so it seems like a daunting task, yet it has to be done. Uh, and this project, which we um, had in 2018, 2019, was co-funded by the Polish and Norwegian authorities. Uh, and it was co-funded in a context where there was a lot of challenges. And still there are challenges, and, and it has been mentioned that there are court cases and things like this going on also. So this is a field where there are conflicts and there are really hard issues as well. And that's precisely a field where we need dialogue. The bigger the conflict, the bigger the need for dialogue. And so this project was set up with funding from the EEA fund, uh, but it was not the main sort of uh, funding mechanism jointly. Uh, it was actually the bilateral fund that Poland and Norway together decide how the money is spent on. Uh, and it was not a research project as such. It was a project that was research-based, 
uh, it was based on knowledge exchange, and it was essentially a dialogue project as much as a project about knowledge exchange, but it was both. And so it was set up in a very interesting way. I've never been part of a project uh, and far less led any project which was set up in this kind of dialogical way, navigating between uh, the Polish and the Norwegian authorities with the embassies in both countries being involved quite actively and hands-on in really wanting to put this into place and actually having embassy staff from the Norwegian embassy in Poland and the Polish embassy in Norway participating in our project activities themselves as well. So that's the background, uh, and this, I think, is an experience which is worth sharing, maybe also in terms of actually as a model of funding and how these things can be set up, uh, but also in terms of the experience we had um, and the lessons that we learned from that. So what I will do now is to say a little bit about what we did, how we worked, very specifically in terms of language, cases, and reflection, and then I'll share some insights and lessons learned uh, from this with you, uh, and this pertains mainly to questions of communication, which I know have already been touched on quite a bit, and really underscoring the need for dialogue. So this project was uh, a trilingual project, and we published a systematic review of existing knowledge about child welfare services and uh, the cooperation across borders in this context, and more specifically really with how migrant populations come into this. And the backdrop here, of course, was the fact that Polish migrants are the by far largest immigrant group in Norway. This has happened very rapidly. Uh, and this was kind of the immediate backdrop for what we were doing. So in Norwegian, our report was called Tillit over Grensne. And in English, of course, Trust Across Borders. And in Polish, it was called Zaufanie ponad granicami. And so one of the reasons why I was asked to lead this is because I'm born in Poland, but I, of course, live and work in Norway, and I work at an international peace research institute, where, of course, peace and dialogue are important to us. Uh, and this is also to say that I am not an expert on the things that you are all experts on. Child welfare services is something I care about, you know, as personally, as a mother. Also, as a researcher, I acknowledge their salience, uh, but my expertise is not within this field specifically. So we had some discussions also about what could we possibly contribute. Uh, and we were then convinced that we could facilitate a dialogue between experts in this field. So that was our role. So one of the first things we realized is that there is a risk of being lost in translation. Uh, and it's a real risk. And this was also the reason why we ended up spending a lot of time on language and communication and seeing how we can avoid getting lost uh, in translation. In terms of the review of the literature, and of, uh, of course a lot of the research that our colleagues that have already presented work earlier today also have done in the Norwegian context, we realize that there's this question of what we know and what we think we know uh, across publications, for instance, in Norwegian, Polish, and English. And you could add many of the other you know, Baltic uh, state languages to this, I'm sure, as well. So there are a lot of reports within countries in their own languages, but not necessarily always communicated in English, maybe to others. So there's a, a, sen a sense that, that we had that perhaps there are things maybe we already know that we don't really realize that we know. So there's a need to, to re be reflecting on that. And then we also realized that maybe, um, as a researcher, this is something you shouldn't say, of course, but maybe actually the need for more knowledge is not really what we need, but it's actually testing methods and implementing existing knowledge. I think many of, of the things that have been discussed today as well, we kind of already know. We know the kind of problem descriptions. What we don't know is how to solve it and how to test, how to measure in a way which types of solutions and implementation procedures might be better or worse and work in particular contexts or not work in particular systemic contexts. So things we were discussing were, for instance, use of interpreters uh, and how you face lacking trust. And this is, of course, an issue which is not only confined to working with migrant or minority populations, but it's a profound challenge for all, of, all types of social work, and most certainly also in, in this context. So the context that we were working in was very specific in that it was very um, conflictual, and there was a lot of media debate. And this was sort of surrounding the project that we had, and we had to deal with it because it was ongoing while the project was also lasting. But we realized that this is, of course, not unique. So we know that there are discourses and debates around the child welfare services, and these affect how people think, how they relate to things. They also shape rumors sometimes. 
And in our context, it was then linked to migrants, migration and its impacts. And in terms of language, then, of course, that the realities that maybe migrants in Norway relate to are as much shaped by media realities in countries of origin, for instance, in Poland in this case specifically, as to what was going on in Norway, but sometimes also both. So really taking that in and in a way acknowledging that whatever good work the caseworkers might be doing in a specific case, this noise around is maybe having an even bigger impact. And what do you then as an individual caseworker actually do with that? At the system level, there are things to be done, of course, uh, and that is also some, some part of what we were doing. So we had uh, this fascinating uh, crowd of people, you might recognize at least one face here, I think, uh, bringing experts together. And as I mentioned, we had the high level people, but we also had caseworkers from both Poland and Norway. We had people who were working in the frontline services, in the child welfare services, um, mainly in, in, in the Norwegian context from Barnevan itself, but also other kind of people who are working in the system around that as well. And the same in Poland, the system is organized a bit differently, but the same kinds of frontline staff were there. And then we had people up to the embassies, we had people from the directorates and everything in, in between as well, and including civil society organizations as well, who were the core of this project. And I think it's worth maybe mentioning and reflecting a little bit on how we related to what trust is. So there are many definitions. If there are psychologists in the room, I'm sure they have their own definitions. But for us, we decided that trust as a key condition for well-functioning human relationships at the personal, societal and cross-border levels was going to be the foundation of how we would work. And we, in a way, also dialogically with the participants agreed that this is how we approach trust. It's very basic, but sometimes it's important to also, I think, stress the very basic. And also the very basic fact that trust is co-produced. It's not something you can take for granted. And it's not something you just have. It constantly needs to be worked on, to be maintained, to be there. So how we worked. I already mentioned that we had these three languages that we had in the project. So Polish, Norwegian and English. Uh, and the core research team was myself and a colleague, Milka Kozhenevska, and we spoke the three languages. And then we had two colleagues, uh, including a psychologist from the University of Gdańsk, uh, and they spoke, of course, Polish and English very well. So with, just within the team that were facilitating and moderating this, we, we knew the three languages quite well. Ourselves, we were already struggling a little bit with some of the key kind of professional terms that I'm sure you're familiar with in English and your own language as well, to try and understand what does this actually mean. So we did quite a lot of work trying to make a glossary together with all the participants. Uh, and we had a lot of interesting discussions within the team groups. So the Poles were discussing with the Poles and Norwegian with the Norwegians, trying to agree what the term was. And then how would you speak about that in English? Uh, and that was really, really interesting in terms of not getting lost in translation and not getting lost in the system as well. Even how do you describe different you know, names of institutions or parts of this system? And then, of course, sometimes different entities change their official name as well, which you know, adds to the confusion. But just to make the point that this sort of language thing is sometimes a bit taken for granted, many of us, I think, uh, now speak very good English, as well as, of course, our mother tongues. Uh, many people, increasing proportions of people, speak other languages. They maybe have other mother tongues. But still, I think there's a lot we can do more in terms of being clear about which words we're using, why, and what they actually mean. And most importantly, not assume that people know what you mean. So really clarify, do you really understand what it is that we're discussing? We worked with cases, so the experts we invited, they maybe thought they were going for you know, a two-day break at a nice hotel and with you know, maybe talks and things, but actually we put them to work. So there was very little of this kind of setting where we sit and listen. Instead, we made them work in groups. We mixed them in different ways, very often across countries. Sometimes we had them in Polish, Polish, Norwegian, Norwegian groups, but most of the time the whole point was we had a person from the embassy and a caseworker from the different countries together in groups. And we actually had then scenarios of cases. And we had scenarios of child welfare cases that were built on experience that we knew this could have been happening. We had some that were extremely complicated and, and difficult, some that were more clear cut. Uh, and we were then discussing exactly the kinds of things that you were starting with this morning in terms of the best interest of the child. And what does that actually mean concretely in these cases? And it was really interesting to note from many of these case discussions, the huge similarities. And so for the caseworkers, that was not so surprising. 
because they work with the children, they work with the families, they work with parents, sometimes with parents who are failing, but with parents who are failing and still maybe love their children really highly, and it's emotionally in all kinds of practical and economic ways very difficult. But they had a shared language, in a way, of that very practical hands-on work. It was maybe more surprising sometimes for the embassy staff that it was so similar, because they were maybe more shaped also by these media discourses about the differences and the conflicts. Different positions, different roles, it's all understandable. But this casework was really interesting for the discussions also within the country teams. So there was not always complete agreement about how the system looks from the top and all the way to the down. And that was the case both in Norway and in Poland. So we had very interesting, engaged discussions. They were very dialogic, very friendly. Uh, and probably there are different views with a reason for why the system looks different from where you stand. But acknowledging that it does is really important to be able to move forward and to resolve issues and challenges that might be there. So the casework was really, really a core component of the work that we did. And it was done, like I said, in groups. And a lot of this was very participatory. And it was participatory perhaps beyond the comfort zone, I think sometimes, of the people that we had there. And again, with the languages, you know, sometimes it was very hard because people thought they spoke good English on both sides, Norwegians and Poles. But when you then have to speak in English about something that is your daily work, it's your profession, it's something that you're good at. And you have to do that in the language which is not your first, maybe not your second. That does something to you. And that also provoked really interesting discussions about how we meet migrant and minority families in the context of child welfare services. On the use of interpreters, but also just on, okay, so how do we actually do this? And how do we acknowledge that someone is completely out of their depth, having to speak about the most difficult thing in their life ever, in a language they feel not secure speaking? And so I think this very sort of embodied experience that people had in those uh, case discussions. Of course, it wasn't their children, it wasn't that experience, but this sort of feeling, I think, sometimes deprofessionalized, because you had to be speaking in the language that was not the one that you really wanted to be speaking on these topics. And sometimes also with really difficult discussions, where there were substantial disagreements uh, about, you know, what would actually be best in this case. So the participants were really good at engaging and um, taking it seriously, to the point sometimes where we had to remind them that this is just an imagined case. So, you know, it's fine, we can go for lunch now, it's okay. But it worked really well, and they really engaged with it, and I think many of them learned a lot. And then we always came back together as a whole group to try and learn from, from each group's discussions, because each group had then very different dynamics in terms of what they actually did. And in good dialogue spirit, uh, the aim was not always to have complete consensus. So we really wanted to accept that there can be room for agreement and disagreement in this kind of work, with reflection being a key component. So then I'll spend the last five minutes or so trying to share some of the insights and lessons learned from this work. So first of all, in terms of communication, this was the core part of our work. That was not really planned, but it became so evident that that was really what we had to be spending time on in the context of working in this cross-country um, project. So mutual understanding is really, really critical. And that is not just an intention, it's something you have to do and practice. And language is really central to how you can do that. Then this issue of media debates that I've mentioned, and for some of you this is very familiar, but really the level of uh, animosity that some of those media debates have spurred in relation to the child where service child welfare services, perhaps in the context of Norway more than some of the other countries, uh, it, it was quite a profound challenge and something that had to be taken seriously by all actors in terms of, okay, what do we do with this and how do we actually treat each other respectfully? Because all the people who were there were people who really work hard for the best of the child, for uh, really good quality services in each of the countries, for, for taking human rights seriously. So how do we maintain a respectful dialogue around that? while there is all this noise around, and while we also, in a way, acknowledge that the media do have a role. Freedom of expression is important. There has to be that space outside of government to criticize. And how do we maintain the balance in how that is then handled? Stereotyping was then the thing we also had to discuss at all kinds of levels. It came from the outside in terms of the media discourses, but also maybe from the inside. Many of us, I think, sometimes have prejudice we have stereotypes that sometimes are there. So how do you then, in a way, work with yourself to try and 
make sure that doesn't interfere in ways it shouldn't. So to build trust, it's necessary to foster understanding and a common language. And media debates can, can, can also contribute to these ends. So we try to also spin that in a positive way in the sense that, okay, maybe there is a place also for the media to, to be somewhere where people can share good experiences. And that also happened. So we try to also, um, you know, not, not have a one-sided perspective also on the role uh, of media and common language. So trust, inclusion and understanding uh, is then built on built through communication and using shared language, which we can't assume comes out of nowhere. That was really the key sort of lesson learned that we had in, in terms of this project. And then to be even more specific, uh, basically we sort of acknowledge that, you know, in theory, a lot of things are in agreement, but then practice is super complicated. So really to, to be useful, such projects have to go into the detail. Now, that's really hard because for specific individual cases, there's confidentiality and you can't do it. So we tried through the casework that we did, uh, which was on hypothetical cases, right, to still try and get into that. And I think that's a really interesting approach in terms of what you can actually do in these types of contexts. And then really trying to drill down on, okay, so what is it that is complicated? Uh, the fact that a single word is not, a, not always a single word when you translate. Sociocultural contexts are very much about interpretation. And even within the Polish or the Norwegian teams, there was very different interpretations. So also acknowledging that. Uh, also acknowledging the roles of institutional histories and landscapes, which are so important. And we realized that also the knowledge about them, the reflection about them, things like age and generation of caseworkers or people who work in these systems also matter. And then English. So is it really a mediating uh, language or not? And I think our conclusion somehow was that it would be better if people actually learned Polish and Norwegian and they could speak directly. Now, not sure that's possible resource-wise or time-wise, but still. And then acknowledging the real labor of communication. And this is a very systemic thing, and it's right back to how much time do caseworkers really have. But I think it also goes to people higher up in the system. How much time do you actually have to be able to invest in communication and in partnership with partners in other countries? This is not something you can just do very, very quickly. It does have to take time to be done well. So this is also a plea for resources, I think, in the way, in terms of the system. So we shared some of the lessons learned from the dialogue part of the project uh, as well uh, in this policy brief, which you can download. Uh, and this was really about the need for dialogue, and that dialogue must be co-created. And like I mentioned, it's about agreement, but also disagreement. That meetings for these kinds of exchanges have to be well prepared. But then it is possible to actually build trust, because trust is something that is not just there. It can be torn down or built up again. And that there has to be an inclusive approach where also civil society actors maybe have an interesting role to play and sometimes can contribute to diffuse conflicts to shed light on things in, in surprising ways. So the question then is, do we want to engage in building virtuous cycles of trust? or leave them and maybe then see vicious cycles of maintaining distrust. And that, I think, is a real choice for, for these systems. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Marta. I think you have inspired all the experts to learn at least nine more languages. Um, in the meantime, we'll stick to English, I think. Um, but I think some of your findings also really confirm the added value of our expert group, having that dialogue, continued dialogue in that trusted environment. But it's now time for me to uh, say thank you to all of the speakers this morning. Uh, it's been very inspiring and enriching. And again, I can uh, on our side commit to that we will certainly uh, be taking these findings forward uh, in the expert group and uh, in our unit. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to Uni, who has the pleasure of moderating our panel and ask all the panelists to come up to take a seat. You are allowed to stand also, if you wish. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Yes, thank you so much for your very interesting presentation and for sharing challenges, actions, knowledge and reflections on child protection as well as collaboration across borders. I am very excited to elaborate more on these issues in this panel discussion. And I will start with one question to you all. And I would like to start with you, Minister, if I may. <laughs> you may. <laughs> <laughs> Based on what has been presented today, are there any specific core elements you want to highlight in terms of building mutual trust and cross-border collaboration in child protection cases? Well, first of all, I would like to say what I sp say usually when I'm speaking to so many specialists, especially when I'm a panel full of specialists, <laughs> that I am only a minister. So <laughs> everything that I would say here is, uh, is just my political thought based, based on my political experience. Uh, what I think is uh, uh, what's been mentioned earlier is the cross-sectoral work and, uh, and uh, what you said about the trust, because the same is uh, within politics. Uh, the trust when it comes to child protection, to children, children's affairs, uh, we have to highlight that uh, much stronger than we, than we are doing. And also uh, what I think is uh, uh, very important is that we have more uh, political discussions about child protection, uh, about children's affairs, because uh, what I was, uh, to, to build up knowledge uh, that politics are also, child protection is also a political issue. Mm. And uh, what I have uh, kind of maybe been missing uh, is, is that part. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, but otherwise uh, I'm full of ideas and I usually, uh, when I participate in mornings like this one, it's, uh, the measure is how, how my head is after the morning, and, and now it's just like full of ideas, and I want to send email to everyone here to ask more <laughs> questions. So, but uh, but uh, yeah, more, more cross-sectoral work and, and link more people into it, because different uh, views and different, different opinions uh, usually lead to the best conclusion. Thank you very much. Are there any reflections? Jörn, do you have any reflections on, on my questions? Yes, I think uh, I'm very much uh, in line with and inspired by Martha mm. that uh, in order to build trust, <clears throat> I think it's very valuable that people come together and discuss specific concrete cases uh, like uh, vignettes. They don't have to be from real life just as you showed, they engage enough, even if they are just uh, made up. <clears throat> but just to discuss in very concrete terms, because building trust, building trust across borders in this issue is very much polluted by uh, harmful politicization. Mm. Saying that I don't think it's wrong to politicize these issues because in a way they are political in the sense that it have, has, have to do with, it has to do with our worldviews, how we look at individuals, children as individuals, for instance, and the responsibility of the community and so on. So it's politically aware, but it, when it's uh, made use of by authoritarian populists, it's another thing. And I think that uh, uh, just talking uh, about very concrete cases is, uh, is uh, the way to go forward. And then, uh, since I'm talking about that, I think uh, it was very interesting what you said, Marta, about uh, the language. When you say Barniem in Norwegian or Domjetska in Polish or Orphanage in English, our understanding of what that is depends very much on what that institution is in our experience from our own home countries. So you have really to specify how many children are living there for how long and so on. And going through via English as a third language is uh, unfortunately necessary. But doing that, we have to, we have really have to treat English as a tool, uh, international tool, and not stick to the specificities of the Anglo-Saxon models and so on, because then a lot gets lost in translation because their systems are so 
puffins are different from our Scandinavian or like in the Polish case, continental mm. systems. So it might be nothing wrong with that model, th these models, but uh, it, it might be misleading to, to automatically uh, just uh, make use of English uh, concepts. Mm. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Atieno, you have been working with all these participating countries. What do you think about this? This, when you have heard now the other presentations, um, <clears throat> I think it's fascinating, and I think it was definitely a sufficient time to go into <laughs> all the things that are ongoing in your countries, because there's a lot, it's, there's a richness there in terms of what's going uh, on, and there's only so much you can present, you know, in a short uh, period of uh, time. Um, but I think that. Um, uh, I think that there seems to be need for interaction. I feel that the, those elements can be areas of interaction between uh, countries where you can learn, because again, it's you know policy legislative. There's more or less uh, there's a lot of similarity, but it's it's when you translate that into practice that it's different, and also the institutional setup. And that's where I think that there could be a lot of uh, uh, learning around uh, those, um, those area, and then many of the challenges are also uh, uh, similar with more discussion. Maybe i just uh, highlight um, two things. Uh, one thing I, uh, I uh, wanted to say is that, again, uh, and I think Andrew also highlighted some of them, you know, within vulnerable children, there are also more vulnerable children, but a lot of them get gets lost in the data uh, and I know I mean I come from different re realities but I know I was never part of the data anywhere because mm -hmm. I fall outside of that but if you don't have data on those different vulnerable groups then then that doesn't transform into practice and inform uh, inform uh, practice so again maybe for the academic community to increase the research on different vul vulnerabilities because there's so many levels of it um, and, and, and then uh, another thing around um, perhaps uh, practice, I mentioned the life cycle um, approach and it seems that many, uh, if we look at the profile of those in care or in the system at the adolescent level, that uh, maybe uh, there a lot of response services rather than prevention uh, services are in, are, are in place and maybe that's also something that could be shared in terms of the experiences and how people are addressing adoles vulnerable adolescents um, in countries. Mm. Asgeir, did you have any yeah. comments? Yeah, I want to push it a little bit further what you're in here talking about because this uh, child protection discourses are very often nationally driven and these, uh, mm. this effort here mm. is a very good effort but it's, uh, it's not at all uh, sufficient to you know, get the borders down and so we can discuss across borders because we have the same systems or norms that we are in fact supposed to enforce and as you were saying do we understand these things in any adequate sense uh, in similar fashion? And I, the, the answer is most likely no, we do not. And so to build trust across borders, to, to, to actually have that as an effort, uh, a dedicated effort, we need to talk to the expectations that people have towards services. Mm -hmm. Because that expectation is a core feature of any trust engagement. And so if you if you expect for instance a threshold of intervention to be uh, much higher because harm uh, the, the 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 harm principle in for instance country x is much uh, more uh, liberal you can as a parent you can do a lot worse <laughs> in some countries than others mm. then we need to communicate these things inside the language that we are supposed mm. to enforce so rights are there because we uh, are supposed to have them <laughs> and that that also provides us with a similar language which is a point of departure to actually build trust so there's a tool in that uh, system of rights yeah mm. yeah marta thanks there was, there was one thing um, this, there was two things i want to mention briefly the first one which i think others are more expert to speak about here which is something we found that was interesting and it was the, the um, if you kind of think about these types of services as a pathway and how you know a, a child a, an adolescent 
their family meets you know the system quote unquote and what they understand is the system which very often is the health the education and any other social social protection types of efforts together so this kind of looking at the pathway through the eyes of the users in the way or the people that you know ultimately the child that you're trying to protect right i think that's an interesting approach across countries maybe as you know as a vignette or as a case to try and explore so that's something we tried to do a bit but it's an idea i think it might be worth exploring further but the other thing i wanted to mention is really um following up from what you were saying also in terms of the national systems uh, and the cross-border part and i think here it's um for me as a migration researcher it's important to kind of say that there are two aspects here so one of them where i feel it uh, from the Norwegian system, which I know quite well, and also from the Polish system that I've gotten to know, know quite well, uh, there's an interesting opportunity in this area to work with diversity, migration-related diversity, questions of, of race and discrimination and these kinds of things in a much more mainstreamed way mm. than many other government institutions uh, currently are mm. able to do. And I think that that's an opportunity which is, you know, should be taken. Mm. It's not to say it's easy. Uh, but it's to say that because we know that many of the, the vulnerable populations of children lack trust anyway, or the parents lack trust anyway, it's not a migrant thing, mm. it's a more general thing. Mm. And so to be able to tackle that, there's a need for a kind of whole of society approach, which means you don't have to single out migrants. Mm. And the reason why that's especially important here is I think because often the elephant in the room is that the best interest of the child as the parents see it, and as maybe as the child and maybe the Norwegian society would see it, are not completely in sync, mm. you know? And you have this kind of children of migrants um, issues coming into these questions, and mm. they're not necessarily child welfare protection issues at all, but they intersect. Mm. Uh, and then there's a lot of loss in translation and confusion and fear, and these things sort of double up. But I think, you know, to, to sort of flip it, I think there's an opportunity here where this type of work, countries could learn from each other, I think, mm. in terms of how you actually meet a more diverse population uh, in this area, and there could be lessons learned for other parts of society and other parts of government as well. Mm. Yeah, a very important perspective. Andrea, do you want to yeah, share totally, some thoughts? Yeah, I totally agree with you, with all of you, because I think it's important to see the person behind everything. And mm -hmm. you, you, I, I think you said that uh, it's important to see that we have limits. But if we can agree in what we are doing and why we are doing it, we, are, we can find similar uh, projects. Uh, and we have the UN, uh, the, the Child Convention, and we all want the best for the children. And we need to talk about what's the best for the children with the child and not uh, with the uh, adult's pers mm. perspective. And I think also it's important to not agree in everything, because if we always say that we agree, mm -hmm. we will not uh, make any change. Mm -hmm. And it's not difficult to not agree, but it's difficult to come to a solution. And that needs time and uh, to be courage as well. Uh, so in, I think we need to get together, but not, all, not only to meet each other, to make a solution of a problem, and then we have to be... Uh, be uh, we have to share the problem and we have to together work with the solution and then present the solution. And like you said, you have to involve more people than ourselves because we are not the experts. Mm. We need to involve the experts in the room. Mm. Thank you. I, I want to pick up on a little bit on this issue with language because we have this term, the best interest of the child which we see is going through all the presentation, is, and it's quite interesting, and, and you were touching up on it now, Martha. So I want to ask, and I want to ask you, Askai, because I know that you work with this, this issue a lot. Um, like, we know that the best interest of the child is perceived differently in and outside of Europe. And um, I would like you to to give some comments on this important consideration that everyone can agree upon, but at the same time seems to be perceived differently. Can right. you say something about that? Are you ready? <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, first of all, we need to pin this where, uh, where it belongs, and that is Article 3.1 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. It would not have been this part of the child protection discourse if it weren't a part of that convention. So it's very important to understand that this is why we talk about it uh, together. So 
what does that mean? It means that you have a, have a constitutional, it is constitutional because it needs to trump regular law. Rights need to do that. So it needs to have this constitutional status. If it doesn't, it should. <laughs> and also that it belongs to the child. So it's the child's best interests, the one right in front of you, the one who needs protection or some evaluation of the need for protection. <clears throat> so your consideration is not actually <laughs> aligned with it mm -hmm. as of now, it's that child's best interests. And one of those things that you see is that you have all these different versions of this principle being embedded across nations. So, uh, and they kind of need to differ because you, uh, you have this thing called margin of appreciation, which means that you, uh, international law depends on national legislation and organizational infrastructure in order to work. So you will have di different kind of formulations of this principle, but we need to have some kind of common logic. So that is speaks to your question. What, what, what can we agree on? And I'm sorry to say that it's very hard, this principle, because in the literature it's, uh, it's uh, so-called indeterminate. It's something that it's you cannot, you cannot reach the aim, something similar to what is in the best interest of a child. Because only the adult version of that child would be able to articulate what is in that child's self-interest, best interest. Mm. And so you need to actually go with a little bit of humility into that child's life and tailor, tailor decision-making. You, you cannot put them into a box. You need to tailor the decision-making. and. Uh, try to approximate what is in that child's best interest. And then, for instance, this is why Article 12 becomes so important. It is to, uh, of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which, is, which means uh, participation. Mm. And especially participation when it's about legal and administrative procedure that affects the child. Mm -hmm. Then it needs to actually participate and tell you who they are. You need to know who that person is. And of course, this is very expensive <laughs> because there's a lot of children, for instance, in Norwegian child protection that then need to be listened to. They, it, it's not a, a box you can tick off. You need to actually get to know that person in order to tailor the decision making. Mm. And also knowing, which is a corrective to this decision, is that you can't decide what is equal to what is in the best interest of the child because it is the adult version of that same person, which you don't have. So the, you, and there are two problems here. One is that you cannot map out the long-term interests of any child. So a six-year-old, you don't know where it is in six years. You don't have access to it. You don't know it. And the other one is that uh, the, what is best for that person in front of you is also something you don't have access to. But you need to collaborate and try to tailor together with all the knowledge you'd have to that decision to that child. So we know that this principle calls for all these things, uh, but it's very expensive. And w whenever I say these things, uh, people kind of, uh, this is too much. <laughs> but it, but, it, but it's it, good. Yes, it is good. It, and, it's, but it's, uh, and it is what it's called for. Mm -hmm. And this is also where the discussion should be to, to make decisions that are to protect that child in that family. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. That's the short version. <laughs> <laughs> a very important version, because bringing in the particip participation of the child, I think, is the core essence. Minister, would you like to say something on this uh, yes. difficult matter? Yes, it's, 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 it's not only uh, very costly, but it's also the most challenging uh, question mm. that you have to go through, because once, for example, when you're increasing the the welfare of children and where to intervene and uh, with early intervention or uh, in child protection cases, it's also challenging to figure out what the child, uh, mm. what the child really wants because it's in these situations where it's, uh, uh, where it's hard to figure out uh, what the child really wants. And, and this is, for example, in Iceland, this is the part, uh, this is the reason why we, when we were uh, reforming the child protection system and making the new law about prosperity for children, that it has to be uh, uh, about the children. The ch child is in the, in the circle and the service providers around, but you also have to have increased uh, 
what would you say, it's both financially and politically increased, mm. uh, of, uh, increased everything that is related to voices of children, especially those in the vulnerable groups. Mm. Because the, the, the danger is that if you have too many adults uh, talking about what the child needs, the voices of the child uh, are not being heard. And uh, we are now, for the next uh, four years, we're going to implement, uh, uh, implement changes when it comes to the voices of children. They have to be heard, they have to be spoken to. Every decision that is taken has to be uh, discussed with the child. But it's challenging. It's not only cost, it's also challenging to implement it systematically into the whole system. And, mm. and, and, but it's uh, interesting. Mm. Andrea, you were talking about in your presentation mm. is exactly this, how to implement, how to make things work. Mm. Can you give some comments on this? With yeah, I think it's really important to, to also see the other side because we have the people who are going to implement mm. the, the, for example, mm -hmm. child participation. Uh, and if we take the social workers, we have to give them the right uh, method to do that because we have mm. problems today that uh, youth or people in vulnerable areas do not trust the social system or the system at all. And how can you create a participation when you don't have the, the, the um, opportunity to, to create a mutual trust between uh, vulnerable people and the social worker? And I think we sometimes speak so much about uh, participation that we forget who is going to do the child mm -hmm. participation and how and also in what are the child going to participate at because mm -hmm. you can't give everything you if you respect the child you can also explain to the to the child this you can't be able to have a, a opinion mm -hmm. on because it's the law but you can have opinion of this and I can give you information of that and all that and have a dialogue and all type of dialogue means time and money mm. and we have today like you said in your research uh, about the social workers mm. they have today not the time to do that mm. so i think it's also really important for all of us to create uh, an arena that the social workers or healthcare uh, persons can have the time to speak to the child create trust and also to the parents mm. and it's not going to Go. It, it, you can't do it overnight. You can You have to have a, a, a perspective of long term, and that means uh, priorities uh, from all of us. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, Jörn, in your in your study, uh, of course, you have cr crossed this this term, the best interest of of the child. Uh, how do they? How how is this perceived in in Romania? <coughs> yeah, that was. Uh... <laughs> In a way, uh, one of the things we found in our interviews with the experts, mm. we're also going to talk with a lot of, uh, of uh, child protection workers and social workers. Uh, that was a point that, of course, it's stated everywhere in the, the policy documents mm. and in the law and so on in Romania, but uh, so far, and everything is preliminary, it seems that uh, the concept has not really been discussed very much. Okay. And it's just uh, accepted as a good intention mm. of uh, being nice to the children. Mm. That's my impression. But uh, mm. this is preliminary, <laughs> so don't quote me. I don't, what do you think, uh, Oscar? Uh, no, I, I think it's, it corresponds a little bit with what i also seen, that you have... Um, you, you don't have that many resources uh, in, in the Romanian child protection system. So it is, uh, the threshold for intervention is uh, much uh, higher. They, they don't go into all the different mm -hmm. kind of cases like you do in Norway, where, for instance, parental competence is the number one uh, reason for uh, mm -hmm. uh, care orders. Uh, mm -hmm. So you, you need really obscene uh, poverty and these kind of things before you activate child protection. And then it's a matter of uh, protecting them from harm. Mm. more than it is actually to reach a decision that is in their best interest. They really need to... So these cases are, quote unquote, it's, they are easy because they really need to be protected. You need to just remove them uh, mm. from the families. But, uh, that is not the... <laughs> I'm 
illustrating mm -hmm. this point, but uh, best interest of the child needs, it calls for tailoring uh, decisions and yeah. by social workers, for instance. Mm. Yeah. Jörn, you wanted to comment? Uh, uh, in the political uh, debate and discourse in Romania, there is, it's not directly linked to the to the Convention of the Rights of the Child, but there is a strong current uh, saying that uh, the, what, the best interest of the child, okay, they don't relate to this concept, but they have the idea that children have got too many rights now. Too many rights. Yeah, and there is also among teachers a kind of uh, mm. tendency among some of them. Mm. But this is a problem and that is not good for the children. It's not that they are against the children, but I think mm. it is too much. So mm. this is a very mm. politicized debate. Yeah. Again, I turn back to that. And, mm. uh, and also this quarrel with the Norwegian Child Protection Services, in one case, uh, Bodniaru case, mm. made a lot of a lot of us in Romania, mm. and even helped create a right-wing populist party. Yeah. So it has, a huge mm. has, has, had, has had huge consequences there. Mm. So then discussing mm. the, the best interest of the child and children's right to participation and so on, it's suddenly, it's uh, immediately made not into a kind of professional discussion of how to do it mm. or mm -hmm. it's uh, or uh, what should I say yeah it's it's politicized and it's uh, it's a foundation of uh, confrontation and not debate mm. yeah. Martha thanks uh, just a reflection really I and mean, maybe also sort of see maybe Athena you would like to comment also back because I'm sort of thinking uh, and this is also based on the experience we had in this Polish-Norwegian cooperation, that, you know, the Norwegian approach to things is not, uh, not very surprisingly quite Norwegian. Mm. Uh, <laughs> but it also means it's, it's based on assumptions about a particular way, a particular way of organizing a state, a society, and a welfare society, and how that's funded. Mm. Uh, and, you know, so in a sense, often it's about throwing money at problems, uh, you know, which we're very fortunate in that we, to a large degree, can do. Mm. Still not enough, but more than, you know, most societies around the world, we can. Mm. So I'm kind of thinking, you know, this is a very mm. sort of particularly corner of the world kind of issue. And I'm thinking that some of the discussions we had with Polish colleagues were already indicative of the fact that that's also a wealthy European state, uh, but it's differently organized mm. and it isn't as rich. Mm. Uh, and so the way of organizing society and who's responsible for what and what levels of services you can expect mm. uh, and what the civil society and the populations themselves have to contribute out of their own goodwill just yeah. by being good people. Mm. You know, it has to factor in. Mm. Now, that also is important in Norway. Yeah. It's not always discussed so much, but we have this sort of idea that, you know, the neighbors are often also important. They don't have a professional role, but in fact, they are very important, right? Mm. So I'm just sort of thinking maybe there are things that, uh, you know, good citizens, the society at large, in a way, should also be contributing here. And especially in terms of what we know is very important in that, once, if, you know, once the problem is there, it's too late to start to build trust. Mm. Mm. So therefore, we in a way need to be engaging in all kinds of you know, low-key, all-inclusive um, actions that include everyone at all times, uh, and that can't be that costly in a sense, mm. uh, to build the basis so that when the crisis hits, the trust is already there. Yeah. Mm. So I'm kind of thinking we need to maybe think about that also in ways that are less resource demanding, mm. even if in particular instances, in particular Scandinavian countries, that's also an issue. But for global applicability, it doesn't work like that. But even within this region, you know, there are different ways of funding these welfare state models, mm. I think. Mm. Thank you. It was a good, uh, that was a good uh, bridge to, the, to my third question. And that is um, related to the COVID-19 and crisis as a whole, uh, because the COVID-19 pandemic posed unprecedented challenges to our child protection system. And more recently, we see the huge impact on child protection system across Europe in the light of the situa situation in Ukraine. So what important lessons have we learned now that can help us make our child protection systems inclusive and resilient including in times of crisis? Big question, mm -hmm. but an important question. I can start. Um, I think it's 
uh, if you think the pandemic, then we had lack of information to children. Mm. And now we have Ukraine. And if we speak uh, from Sweden, we have a lot of information of rights and everything, but given from several different parts of the society. And I think it's really important when something happens, a crisis, small or bigger crisis, to have a child perspective in the information, but also give the information to the child or the parents or the whole family in when they are they when they can take information yeah. uh, and, and make sure they understand uh, not just produce some uh, information and then publish it and then you are done make sure that they understand their rights uh, make sure they understand how the new uh, system works and also uh, make sure they the information reach the vulnerable uh, persons mm. or children. So that's one thing, the information is really, really important uh, and uh, with the child perspective. And the other one is, is to learn from our experience because we all, now we have a lot of experience in crisis uh, and we have a lot of uh, knowledge, but how can we take the next step mm. so we don't build it again mm and to be more efficient, but also to give more result to the children. Because uh, if I think of Barn and uh, they all, always says in their annual report that we are not good in, in, in include children before, under, after a crisis. And we know that. And then the next crisis happens and mm. we do the same. Mm. We are too smart to do that mistake again. We have mm. to do now mm. and be prepared so we can act. Uh, to protect children and their family before they are in huge uh, need of support. Mm. Atiano, I want to ask you, because this was a, 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 an important part of our project, mm. to see how, how child protection systems were resilient in times of crisis. Mm. Do you, can you give some reflections on this, this apart from what you have been, been uh, presenting for, your, for us earlier today? Um, I think in, in addition, so I would say they are resilient, but I think for uh, two reasons. I, I think that um, uh, these crises always present opportunities, yeah? and I think the opportunity is that the public at large are understanding that child welfare is central, right? Mm -hmm. um, COVID through the health or education, the impact on the education um, system. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, with uh, Ukraine and previous crises is immigration, understanding that because, you know, child, child welfare. So it's, it's, it's basically raising the um, mm. focus and the uh, essential role that child welfare plays in society, that's one. And then I think from, again, with Ukraine, I'm, I'm way, you know, I know that maybe your news media, the only thing you hear about is Ukraine, but from where I'm sitting, we have, you know, we have other crises yes. going on that are <laughs> that are ongoing and yeah. consistent for for you know we have a drought <laughs> happening, so it's mm. slightly less uh, you know. So I'm I'm a bit outside of it, but I can see from the little that I've seen that when there is political will and there comes your issue that there is political will, there is action. Yeah, uh, on the Ukraine crisis in terms of children and uh, ensuring child protection uh, for that. So I think that's an important um, aspect and that your systems can respond once there is that political leadership and, and will. And maybe, mm -hmm. again, if the crisis was in Sudan or Syria or, or whatever, it might be different, right? But there is political will to change and it can change. Mm -hmm. uh, through it, so to see the opportunities. <laughs> uh, Martha, this is this is your field, isn't it? Migration. What yes. is what is your ref reflections on this? I think, uh, firstly, in relation to the sort of pandemic, I think one of the um, very clear observations in the Norwegian context, and I don't think it's very dissimilar in other countries, was that the Norwegian authorities were largely not prepared to be able to communicate with a diverse mm. population in a crisis. Mm. Mm. Uh, and this is, in a way, it's, it's kind of shocking. Yeah. Uh, so I think that, and that admission has not been made very properly, mm. uh, but the Public Health Institute was doing uh, heroic work to engage with migrant communities in their different languages. Mm. That is not the job of the Public Health Institute. Mm. Mm. Uh, so, you know, I think there's, there's quite a lot of lessons learned there, and they, they're, sort of, they're sort of being put somewhere. 
Uh, I'm very curious to see whether, you know, indeed, it, you know, appropriate institutional um, setups will be available. Because, it's, like I mentioned before with the trust, you know, it's, once mm -hmm. the crisis hits, you can't then think, what should we do? Mm -hmm. Because then you have to deal with the crisis. So you really have to have a preparedness for a diverse population, also for crisis. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's also about children. Mm -hmm. And it's about all children. And then, of course, within that is also about the children who the most need protection. So I think that's kind of a very general uh, comment where I think in a lot of societies uh, failed. And it links back to what you were saying with information not being communication. So just having some pamphlet translated by someone into a language mm. is not communicating with those parents mm. or those population mm. groups, I think. Mm. Mm. And then I think more generally on the migration comment, I would, <laughs> I would agree. I think that you know, there are different types of, uh, of situations that occur in European societies. And I think what uh, the, the war in Ukraine is, has shown is that when there is political will, there is action on a whole number of issues. Mm. Um, and I think there it's, uh, it's an interesting reflection, which hopefully once there is peace, hopefully soon, we can start to be making about what, this, that, what that means for how we treat migrants and minorities from other parts of the world mm. and what types of rights uh, refugee mm. children have when they arrive, mm. how we understand their needs for education. For instance, the fact that there seems to be, thankfully, a bigger understanding for the need for Ukrainian kids to maintain education in Ukrainian mm. than I've seen ever before, yeah. really, mm. in this part of the world mm. for refugee children. Mm. So I think that now is maybe not the time and place for that discussion, but I think there are some very uh, mm. clear lessons learned that also have an implication for your work, but maybe more as part of the general approach to children mm. than specifically mm. only to the most vulnerable children, I think. Mm. Okay. Mm. Minister, do you have any uh, just thoughts on this? Just a little bit about this. Uh, 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 I agree when it comes to uh, the COVID-19 and the migrant uh, uh, families that we didn't do uh, enough to reach uh, them. But, uh, but uh, what I like to comment on is uh, uh, the political will that you mentioned. And I've been thinking about uh, this morning, uh, how can we, because it's all about funding, it's about money. Mm -hmm. uh, money is the, the action. and. Uh, and what I think is uh, important is that uh, and politics and ministers, uh, parliamentarians and especially finance ministers, they don't t think about children's rights. They think about money, GDP, uh, those, those things. And what we did with the new prosperity law is that we uh, hired the economist, uh, the main economist of Chamber of Commerce. He made the evaluation of the, uh, of the changes mm -hmm. uh, how much money we needed, uh, how cost effective it was, mm. uh, and when it started paying back. And the people in the social ministry at that time with social background and welfare background, they almost denied to sit down with him because what would he know about welfare? Mm. It's a human right, as you mentioned. Mm. <laughs> but I said, no, we need to do this because I have to sell it to the finance minister. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and he figured out that it was the best investment ever made, but we were only catching, uh, catching a little percentage with the first, first step of the changes. We were only catching a least, little uh, mm. part of the, the children that uh, we could uh, catch. Exactly. Uh, and now we are mm. uh, doing the same in the new Ministry of Education and Children. We are setting up an economics department that's going to evaluate everything related to children, education, and part of it is migration, uh, migrant families, because we haven't been handling that well. Mm. But do we know how much it costs? Uh, our failure uh, when it comes to migrant families, mm. do we know how much it costs the uh, society? I don't think so. But if we can measure that, Mm. then we can stop looking on it as a cost and mm. an investment. And mm. that, is, mm. that is the plan for the f ne these three years I have, mm. uh, is to make uh, early interventions when for children uh, measured as an investment, not as a cost. But then we have to measure it as an investment. But it is a challenging question again, because we know it's a human right. And we don't want to measure human right as an investment. No. Mm. But that is the way to get the money. Mm. And this is just something I wanted to leave here uh, in the end, because uh, uh, in the end, it's all about how can we get money and get other people outside uh, of our circle understand that mm. we need more money to uh, hire more social workers, to more, to more for migration children. Uh, and by doing that, uh, if, we can, if, if we can win that one, mm. that battle, then we, were, we are on the right track. 
Thank you. I think that was a very good ending of this discussion. A very uh, open uh, statement from a politician. Mm. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and uh, with this, I thank you for the for the for this uh, this panel discussion. And I want to introduce uh, Mr. Olaf Bashta to give the final statement for this conference. Uh, Olaf Bashta is uh, a diplomat working for the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and he is also the chairman for the CBSS Committee of Senior Officers, officers under the Norwegian Presidency. So now you can finish off this conference. Thank you very much and thank you. Let me see. <clears throat> Only thank you very much, but thank you everybody for showing the CBSS in action and in the priority area for our organization, namely ensuring a safe and secure uh, life for the citizens. Um, okay, so I represent the Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs, the presidency of the uh, Council of the Baltic Sea States, and we will soon leave the presidency in a few weeks' time to Germany, as we did uh, receive the presidency from Lithuania a little less than a year ago. But in the meantime, of course, the world, Europe, has changed. Um, the situation is far from normal. The vision of a safe and secure region is unfortunately more distant. And this is thanks to one of our member countries, or I should say one of the former member countries. Russia's illegal actions against Ukraine, the all-out war la launched, and the massive dislocation of people and destruction have shocked us all. Ukraine not only is a country uh, in our neighborhood, protected by international law, but uh, also an observer state of the uh, CBSS. Uh, the violation of Ukraine's sovereignty ongoing since 2014 and uh, dramatically worsened in February this year led uh, all the other members of the CBSS to conclude that business could not go on as before as if nothing had, has happened. Russia was wrong in believing that events would pass and war eventually be f forgotten by decision makers and history. And personally, I've been ambassador to Ukraine. I can see the uh, terrible uh, things happening and I think for us Europeans returning to the darker corners of history, 20th centuries and before, not an option. Russia was suspended from the CBSS, and now, on the 17th of May, Russia formally informed that they would withdraw their membership in the CBSS. It is obvious uh, to us that the Russian leadership has no interest or willingness to stick to the principles of international law, the commitments they have claimed to support with regard to multilateral and regional cooperation. I've been uh, with the Norwegian Foreign Ministry since 1980. We have always been into communication. I was uh, really intrigued by Marta's presentation about the importance of language, uh, importance of communication. And I, here I think we have um, a breakdown of communication, and it has been delivered. But I think what we have seen, uh, not only in this group, but in all the other formats of regional cooperation with Russia, working or building trust from below, sector by sector, um, people to people contacts, professional uh, meetings, um, seeing the um, similarities more than the differences, and working to reduce um, discomfort, distrust, it works but it, uh, it has also failed in this, uh, in this uh, context. But um, Russia's withdrawal has also now opened up for increased cooperation between the other 11 members of the Council of the Baltic Sea States, and it has allowed us, Norway, to host a ministerial meeting for the first time in, since uh, 2013, in fact. It was hosted by our foreign minister in um, Kristiansand uh, on the 24th and 25th of May, and concluded with a strongly worded and forward-looking declaration, committing us all, the 11, 
to continuing cooperation and strengthening cooperation. I don't need to read from the declaration, but um, there was an emphasis here on, um, on the so-called Vilnius II declaration adopted during the Lithuanian presidency last year, a vision, very ambitious vision for the development of the Baltic Sea states um, uh, or region uh, until 2030. The ministers also highlighted the role of young people, civil society and their participation in decision-making processes, strong cooperation against organized crime and trafficking in human beings for the protection of vulnerable women and children and in the field of civil protection, all these uh, things have become ever more important in the present situation. There was a reference now, uh, of course, many times to Ukraine. And um, I think we were in the committee of senior officials very impressed when we received, we saw that the expert group on, on uh, children at risk took this issue seriously, um, came up very early with the recommendations and um, issues to focus on in the cooperation and this was ele elevated uh, in our organization. We discussed it and focused on it in the Committee of Senior Officials. So this was also the CBSS in action, adopting, adapting to changed circumstances to crisis. The uh, expert group has also been good at pointing to the uh, crisis we have now almost forgotten, namely the pandemic. You also mentioned the pandemic as a crisis. Uh, with communication, uh, all the, uh, those issues, but also the issue of um, additional stress and threats to families, uh, families under in distress, uh, mental health among young people and, and children and families. And all of this is also part of our uh, CBSS uh, family of cooperation. Seen from a foreign policy angle, and seen from um, the CBSS presidency, I think we can all be proud of the way we and you have handled this and put focus on the issues I mentioned. Um, today's conference had a broad and comprehensive agenda. I didn't say that uh, I was following uh, the opening and so on, uh, live streamed from my office. Great opportunity. So we have also, during the pandemic, of course, learned new, new methods of communication, of being together. But I th in this case, it worked uh, very, very well. So uh, thank you for, for this um, uh, type of organization. Minister Dadason mentioned in his uh, first intervention that child protection is one of the most important security nets of our societies. And indeed it is. And I think it... Uh, if everybody could start with the interest of the child and the society, we need to build uh, resilient uh, and good societies. Uh, this would be a big, big uh, advantage. So, uh, by uh, in conclusion, um, the expert group on children uh, on children at risk is one of the most visible parts of the CBSS cooperation. We're very proud of the issues you have uh, focused on. We have seen from the presidency, I think this is universal in the um, family of the uh, committee of Sem senior officials, the excellent cooperation between the group and the chair of the group and the secretariat in Stockholm. And this is in fact, um, uh, a formidable achievement and success when it comes to how international cooperation should work among countries. Okay, now we lay, lose one or has lost one, hopefully temporarily. Um, but we're very proud of it. We wish you all the uh, success. I should at the end, very end, just thank UNI for uh, the uh, chairmanship of the expert group, Olivia, for the unit and the support in, uh, in Stockholm. Um, the Secretariat is definitely visible, and we have had also a good dialogue in the committee, focusing on these issues, even 
in several meetings. And uh, once and more, thank you very much for the uh, input on the Ukraine, but also in the other <coughs> uh, other as uh, aspects of um, of cooperation. So that concludes my ta task. I didn't bring any flowers. <laughs> I should have, but maybe just a, an applause uh, to Unni and uh, Olivia, everybody else, the panel and the speakers. <laughs>